then the real exam begins. <laughs> so, uh, good morning everyone. Welcome to day two. And that was the glaucoma day. So, let get, uh, let's get the right angle to these angles. And we begin the session with uh, Dr. Swati Singh, ma'am. And uh, she is a cataract, glaucoma, and anterior segment surgeon at CFS, Sabdarjan Enclave, uh, New Delhi. Uh, so over to you, ma'am, for your talk. Okay, thank and, you, Radhika. And uh, uh, we have our chair for the session, Dr. Harsh Kumar, sir. And uh, Dr. Shweta, ma'am, will be joining us very soon. So welcome to everyone. So thank you, Rolika, And a very good morning to all of you. I shall be speaking on intraocular pressure, the concepts and measurement. And I hope all of you have uh, done tonometry or at least seen the tonometer, okay? So uh, what is intraocular pressure to begin with? It is the pressure inside the eye to maintain the integrity and the normal functioning of the globe. And it is maintained by a balance between the aqueous humor inflow and the outflow. So um, what is aqueous humor? You know that, na? So it supplies nutrition to the anterior structures of the eye and is secreted by the non-pigmented ciliary epithelium. You can see in this picture. So it is secreted from the ciliary epithelium and reaches the anterior chamber and is drained at the anterior chamber angle. Fine? So the rate of secretion is 2 to 3 microliters and uh, the volume of anterior chamber is roughly 250 to 300 microliters. And the turnover rate is 2.5 microliters per minute. So what is being formed? It should exit the eye also to maintain the pressure in the normal range. So, uh, and why do we need to measure the intraocular pressure? Because it is one of the causal risk factors for glaucoma. And we all know that glaucoma is the leading cause of irreversible blindness all over the globe. So, and also uh, intraocular pressure is the only modifiable risk factor in the glaucoma management or treatment. So, and it has been seen in studies that if we reduce the intraocular pressure, it delays the onset of glaucoma in patients who have ocular hypertension or raised pressures. Then it also slows the disease progression in individuals with established glaucoma. Therefore, an accurate IOP measurement has a significant role in glaucoma monitoring and therapy. What is normal intraocular pressure? Uh, it lies somewhere between 10 to 21 millimeters of mercury, although there is nothing normal. They say that uh, uh, every eye has a different uh, normal for that particular eye. And uh, in studies, it was seen that the normal IOP was 15.5 millimeters plus minus 2.5 millimeters of mercury. And two standard deviations above the mean was taken as the upper limit of normal. So uh, the distribution of intraocular pressure in the general population is not uh, uh, Gaussian, but it is skewed towards the right side or towards the higher intraocular pressures. Uh, then coming to tonometry, it is a technique of measuring intraocular pressure and the device that is used to measure intraocular pressure is the tonometer. And uh, it is an essential component for the routine eye examination. And an ideal tonometer should be accurate, should be easy to use, a simple calibration should be there, and it should be repeatable, reproducible, and easy to clean. And it should also reflect the other properties of the cornea, like uh, biomechanical properties and the thickness of the cornea. So uh, classification of tonometers is done on the basis of the deformation that is done uh, in the globe to produce the, uh, is, which is produced by a force. And uh, we can classify them into indentation tonometers and applination tonometers. Indentation causes a, a truncated cone-shaped deformation of the uh, eye or cornea and displaces a large volume of the fluid. Applanation may there is only a flattening of a small area with a small fluid displacement. They can be of variable force or variable area type of tonometers. Then comes the non-contact tonometer where the, we do not touch the cornea but only an air puff is needed to deform the cornea. Then there are uh, various other types of tonometers like dynamic contour tonometer, the transpalpebral tonometer and uh, many others. So the most accurate method of tonometry is the manometry. And here a probe or a needle is connected to a manometer and inserted in the anterior chamber. But this method is invasive, therefore it is very impractical. We cannot use it in routine practice. It is used only in experimental studies. 
and the other method is digital, uh, digital tonometry. So when you don't have anything or there are some hopeless cases where you cannot use any tonometer, you use the digital tonometry. And you all should practice how to do a digital palpation of the eye. You ask the patient to look down and you uh, uh, put one finger over the globe and uh, uh, feel the fluctuation. By uh, applying some pressure through one finger, you feel the fluctuation through the other finger. And uh, comparison is always done with the fellow eye. And uh, you can classify them as normal digital tonometry or uh, a firm uh, tension or a hard eye, a stony hard eye, or even a soft eye. But this method is subjective. It is not very reliable, but it is the only choice sometimes. So you should practice in normal eyes as well as in eyes who have high intraocular pressure to get a feel. Now, the indentation tonometry. The uh, prototype is the short tonometer. You all must have used short tonometer right, or at least seen the tonometer. Here, we, what we do, we indent the cornea with the help of a plunger. And uh, it has weights attached to the plunger. And uh, uh, a truncated cone type of deformation is produced. Okay? So, and this also displaces a large amount of fluid. That is why it is not uh, very reliable. And uh, uh, the concept of ocular rigidity comes into play here. Uh, what happens in ocular rigidity? It is the resistance of deformation of the uh, ocular cords to uh, the external pressure that is being applied to the eye. And uh, it influences the intraocular pressure measurement by indentation method. And the patients who have high ocular rigidity, the globes which have high rigidity, you need more force to deform such globes. So what will you have? You will have high intraocular pressure in such eyes as you see. Sorry, as you see in high hyperopia in chronic glaucoma patients or in sometimes ARMD patients. And when the rigidity is low, there is less force that is required and you get a falsely low reading of the intraocular pressure. And it is seen in high myopes, vitrectomized eyes in uh, patients uh, of osteogenesis imperfecta or collagen vascular disorders. What do we have? So uh, we have this prototype is the Schwartz tonometer. Uh, it was invented by Halmer Schwartz in 1905. This tonometer has a hollow uh, barrel. You can see this barrel over here. And uh, uh, this uh, inside this barrel is a free floating plunger. And uh, this plunger has a fixed weight of 5.5 grams. And uh, there are some additional weights which are supplied. And uh, the um, end plate, this foot plate is concave in shape. And uh, uh, th when this tonometer is held vertically over the eye with the holder, this plunger will move downwards and it will indent the cornea. And this small movement of the plunger will deflect uh, through this liver arm on the scale and you get a reading. So these readings, this is not the uh, IOP reading, but you have to convert this through a nomogram to get the intraocular pressure in millimeters of mercury. Okay. So uh, this is the Friedenwald's conversion table that we used to uh, follow during our uh, PG times. And you can see there are different scale readings and the pressure uh, that is being used for indentation and you get corresponding IOP levels. But the problems are, as I said, it is influenced by scleral rigidity and muscular contraction. If the patient is squeezing the eye too hard or uh, if it, uh, the patient is accommodating, all these things can change the intraocular pressure measurements. Then there is one Moses effect when the uh, I, at the low scale readings, the cornea gets molded between the uh, plunger and the hole. And this pushes the plunger up and gives falsely high intraocular pressure. You should know these things just for uh, Viva point of view. Then comes the applanation tonometry. This is based on Imbert fixed law. And uh, what is this Imbert fixed law? It says that the pressure in, uh, inside an sphere, which is an ideal sphere. What is an ideal sphere? It is a perfect sphere, completely dry, has a, uh, it is perfectly flexible and is infinitely thin. So in an ideal sphere, the pressure uh, is equal to force uh, which is applied externally per unit area of the, uh, that is flattened. So uh, this P, we can calculate the pressure if we know uh, F or A or any of them is fixed. So this is how we do the applanation tonometry. Uh, it can be a variable, uh, force or variable area type of thing. Um, like this is here, you have in this picture, first two pictures, it is constant area. 
So uh, when the area is constant, you need more force when the pressure inside the eye is higher. But when the uh, pressure inside the eye is lower, you need a lesser force for applanation, the same area. And similarly, uh, when uh, in the other type, when the um, force is constant but the area changes, this depends upon the pressure of the eye. When the pressure is high, uh, a small area is applanated by a constant force. But when the pressure is low, it will be indenting, uh, applanating more of the area. So, but uh, there are some extra forces which are acting in Imbert fixed equation, which are the surface tension and second is the corneal rigidity. The surface tension is the capillary action of the tear meniscus, which pulls this, this, this is the surface, uh, you have a pointer. Uh, the capillary action of the tear meniscus, which pulls the tonometer tip towards the cornea and causes an underestimation of the intraocular pressure because the tonometer is itself moving towards the cornea. You don't need additional pressure. So this will give falsely low readings. And the second pressure is the corneal rigidity, uh, which is the resistance that is offered by the cornea to deformation. And both these forces, they act in the opposite direction. And that is why the modified Imbert fixed law was devised, which says F plus S is equal to PA plus C. Um, so when the area is fixed at uh, 7.35 millimeters square, uh, this happens when the diameter of applanation is 3.06 millimeters. These S and C, they cancel each other. Thank you so much. So uh, when the area becomes 7.35 millimeters square, S will cancel C and F will become equal to P. So the uh, prototype is the Goldman applanation tonometer. You all know. Uh, how it looks like. Um, this is a constant area, variable force type of applanation tonometer, and a truncated cone. Uh, you can see the prism here. This is the prism of uh, uh, applanation tonometer. It is in the shape of a truncated cone, and uh, it has a diameter of 3.06 millimeter, and area is the same as we need for applanation. And then there is a doubling prism that is embedded in the cone, which uh, divides this circular meniscus. You normally get a circular meniscus, but this is a split by this doubling prism into two semicircles. And the end point of applanation is when the inner uh, walls of these semicircles, they are come in continuation. So that is the point where you have to check the reading. And uh, uh, here you need to, then there, there is this pressure norm. You can um, change the force that is being applied and you start with one, that is uh, one is equal to one gram is 10 millimeters of mercury. You multiply it with 10, okay? So uh, you need an anesthetic drop and you need a fluorescein uh, uh, stain for the tear film. And tonometer tip is advanced towards the uh, cornea while you are, keep, you are viewing through the uh, slit lamp uniocularly. And uh, then you find the force that is needed to align these myers. Now there are sources of error as the surface tension changes with the tear film thickness. So when, um, uh, when the, the thickness of the tear film is too much or there is too much of fluorescein inside, what will you have? You will have some, these thick myers. And what does that mean? When there is too much of tear film or fluorescein dye, this will cause a low surface tension. And low surface tension inadequately balances, in, counterbalances the corneal resistance and this gives you a falsely high reading. So thicker myers means higher reading, and this is false. This is not true. You have to wipe the uh, tear film or uh, the fluorescein stain and do it again. And when the myers are thinner, similarly, you will get a falsely low IOP reading. Then there are other sources of error like corneal astigmatism. So it is seen that for every four diopters of with the rule astigmatism, there is one millimeters of underestimation of the intraocular pressure. And uh, uh, for the against the rule astigmatism, you have overestimation of IOP. And uh, in high astigmatism, what do you see? The myers are distorted, okay? So um, what we do, we have two methods. Number one is that you can align, either align the uh, minus cylinder of the uh, uh, eye with the, this red mark. This is roughly placed around 43 uh, degrees from this white mark. And uh, then you take the reading. Or the other method is that you uh, do one horizontal measurement and a vertical measurement and you uh, average the two values and get the uh, approximate reading of applanation tonometer. So um, then there are other sources uh, that, I mean, if, if you are not exposing this, uh, tip is not exposed properly, 
Illumination is inadequate, you can get uh, uh, incorrect readings. And also when the tonometer tip is not lying directly on the surface, on the center of the cornea, or is paracentral in position, you will have inaccurate readings. Now there are conditions where, get, where you will get falsely low IOP or falsely high IOP, and we have discussed many of these conditions. When the patient is squeezing the eyes too hard, you will get a higher pressure. And uh, uh, also the uh, position of the eye, as we discussed yesterday also, that it should be in a plane. It should hit perpendicular to the uh, center of the cornea. Then um, the effect of corneal thickness. Uh, the Goldman tonometer, this overestimates the IOP in thick corneas and underestimates in thinner corneas. And there are nomograms which convert this IOP to the cornea corrected IOP, but uh, none of them are very accurate. And also there are biomechanical properties of cornea which come into play, which are very individual to each eye. And uh, they cause a change in stiffness of the cornea and alter the measurement. So that is why we are having newer tonometers which are incorporating these properties in the in their measurement. So now the calibration, uh, for the calibration we have this rod uh, uh, given with the uh, applanation tonometer. It has marks 0, 2 and 6 with the weights actually and uh, uh, you need to calibrate the uh, tonometer. Uh, ideally it should be done monthly but uh, otherwise they say ki up to 2.5 millimeters of uh, mercury it can be tolerated clinically but, uh, because when you are doing only it is a single person use uh, you know about your tonometer and you can uh, get the accurate measurements based on the uh, levels so uh, the sterilization we all know you have to clean it before every use and uh, you can use uh, sodium hypochlorite or 3% hydrogen peroxide but whichever uh, disinfectant you are using make sure that the tonometer tip is perfectly dry before using it again on the uh, next patient. Then uh, Perkins tonometer it is similar to uh, Goldman applanation tonometer except for it is, uh, it is portable and battery operated and that is why we use it in uh, children or in EUA, it can be used in supine position. Then the Mackay mark tonometer, this applanates the cornea with a plunger of 1.5 mm diameter and uh, this plunger protrudes slightly from the surrounding rubber sleeve uh, which is 3 mm in diameter. So this is the uh, probe and there is a sensitive transducer which converts the plunger displacement into an electrical signal which can be recorded on a paper chart, you need a graph. And uh, this tonometer is more uh, um, uh, useful in scarred, irregular, or um, edematous cornea. So what happens here in Mackey Mark tonometer, in the center there is this plunger. This plunger, um, uh, when the instrument touches the cornea, the plunger and the supporting spring, they are opposed by the IOP and the corneal bending pressure. So as the instrument advances to the point of applanation, this uh, corneal bending pressure is transferred to the foot plate. It has this plunger in the center, and uh, which initially indents the cornea, but later on as the instrument moves forwards, this foot plate comes in contact with the cornea. So as the foot plate comes here, this uh, all the bending and uh, uh, these forces are transferred to the foot plate and this plunger measures only the IOP reading. And this is what you see in the graph. Uh, the, initially the pressure rises and when you see this dip over here, this is the point where the foot plate has taken uh, over and you get the true IOP reading. The height of this uh, uh, dip is the IOP reading. So uh, next is tonopen. It is also a Mackey Mark type of tonometer. It is, you all must have seen this tonopen. And it is a portable handheld battery operated tonometer. There is this uh, uh, LCD display uh, which gives you the uh, average of all the pressure readings. And here again, this is a small plunger and this is a disposable slip. A sleeve over here. So disinfectin, uh, disinfection is not a problem in this uh, tonometer and uh, it creates an electrical signal as the foot plate flattens the cornea and we, we take multiple readings and which are averaged and digitally displaced on the screen. Okay. So. Uh, one minute. Yeah. Go ahead, go ahead. One minute left. <laughs> okay. Sorry. <laughs> So then um, pneumatic tonometer, uh, it uses both indentation and applanation principles. And here there's a small tip and it is uh, used to indent the cornea with a 5 mm silicon tip. The pressure forcing the tip ahead when the tip and cornea are both flat and an equilibrium is achieved, it is used to measure the intraocular pressure. So this correlates well with the GAT in normal pressure readings but ranges, but uh, it overestimates or underestimates in the higher and lower uh, pressure readings. So um, 
This is portable and easy to use, but you need an anesthetic. And it is used in scarred or edematous corneas over soft contact lenses and also in gas filled eyes. Uh, the Corvus ST, Corvus ST tonometer, this is Scheinflug camera, which gathers a 4330 frames per second within a 100 millisecond period. And uh, a reading of 1 to 60 millimeters can be recorded. Uh, you, then um, this notifies the operator when the tonometer is properly placed. There is a proper alignment system and um, uh, reports the IOP automatically. You don't have to do anything. Only air is used for uh, uh, deformation. And uh, um, uh, this is quite promising and uh, gives you about um, uh, some details about the corneal biomechanical properties as well and the pachymetric progression basically used for by cornea people. So ORA was the ocular response analyzer. This is again uh, measuring the, uh, here a jet of air is used as the applanating force. And uh, uh, here you take the applanation readings twice. Once when the jet of air forces the cornea inwards. So the inward applanation is noted. And the second is the outward applanation, when the cornea is coming back to its normal position. And the difference between these two readings is the corneal hysteresis. And uh, corneal hysteresis is an important factor in glaucoma. It has been found to be reduced in patients with glaucoma. And also, um, it represents the biomechanical property of the cornea. So, uh, there's no time actually. Uh, this will Let's be covered. Sum it up, uh, I think. Oh, yes, yeah. sir. Then, just... lastly, this uh, eye care rebound tonometer. This is the latest equipment, and it's quite uh, uh, easy to use. And um, uh, the readings are also uh, quite close to uh, Goldman applanation tonometer. Uh, but they are affected with um, by a corneal uh, thickness, and uh, it can be used over contact lenses also. So you have this probe uh, kind of thing, um, um, which is propelled towards the cornea. You can see in this picture. So it's propelled towards the cornea, and uh, the higher the IOP, the faster the, uh, you, it measures the deceleration of the probe. And um, uh, the higher the IOP, the faster the probe decelerates, and the shorter is the contact time. So non-contact tonometer, you all have seen, it is an air puff tonometer, and uh, applanation tonometer uses air to flatten the uh, cornea. And um, uh, the readings are not very um, uh, accurate in uh, high intraocular pressure ranges. Then, um, but it is used for mass screening. Then lastly, this dynamic contour tonometer or the pulse, Pascal's tonometer, it does not, uh, uh, it causes an, uh, a contour matching to the cornea. There is no force or applanation to the cornea, but uh, there's a concave tonometer tip, which uh, causes the cornea to assume the shape. And uh, if the apex of the cornea is tension free, they say the pressure on both the sides should be equal. And there is a piezoelectric sensor, which is embedded in the tip. And this measures the dynamic pulsatile fluctuations in IOP. This is the uh, tonometer. Then the transpalpable tonometer, it is a rebound tonometer through the upper lid. And um, it is used in patients who have keratoprosthesis or capro. And uh, then the newer tonometers, they will be covered in uh, a different lecture. But this is Triggerfish device, which is a contact lens kind of device and measures the variations in the corneal curvature with the changes in the intraocular pressure. And uh, there are some special circumstances like irregular corneas, you have to use uh, pneumotonometer is more accurate. Uh, similarly, over the soft contact lenses, pneumotonometer and tonopen. In gas filled eyes also, we use tonopen. K Pro, digital tonometry or a diaton transpalpable tonometer. Infants and children, eye care rebound tonometer, Perkins or handheld NCT. And uh, in post classic cases, we use Corvus ST and DCT. And keratoconus DCT, post BR surgery, GAT or rebound. Thank you very much. Thank you, Swati. That was wonderfully done in the time <laughs> given to you. <laughs> and you. I'm really sorry we don't have time for questions <laughs> at this moment. But if you have, please write down and send it to us. We'll try and cover it. And now we have uh, another star for you that is Dr. Shweta Tripathi. And uh, she is a senior consultant in glaucoma and cataract in the Indira Gandhi Institute uh, in Lucknow. And she is now a zonal representative in the Glaucoma Society of India. And uh, she has been an editor of DOS Times. Plus, she has innumerable papers and awards and honors. So Shweta will tell us about gonioscopy. Thank you, sir, for that kind words. And a very good morning to all of you. So again, taking a step ahead and just trying to simplify the topic given to me for you. 
I would also like to thank Swati ma'am for covering tonometers. So tonometers was also a topic that was being covered by Dr. Amit Purwal sir, who will not be able to join us on the day that he has assigned. So ma'am has already covered that for you guys. So that's great. All right. So at the outset, I would like to thank Dr. Mahipal sir, Dr. Santosh sir, the entire scientific team, including Dr. Ritika, Dr. Rolika, for having me as a part of this academic feast. So let's uh, just get started. Let me see that how much I can simplify this gonioscopy for you. So as we all know that basically the purpose of this is the evaluation of the angle of the anterior chamber because that helps you to make the diagnosis correct to treat the patient accordingly and to assess the progression of your case as well. So the topic uh, is going to flow under these subheadings, like we'll talk about the principle, the type, the contraindications, the indi indications, all those things. <clears throat> So before we proceed further, just a few liners about the history. We all know it's all given in the books that the father of gonioscopy is Salzman and gonioprism was introduced by Goldman. And Trantas was the person who uh, uh, first coined the term gonioscopy. So the need, as I said, that see, you have to evaluate the angle. Why that is important? Because you have to differentiate between the pathology of the glaucoma. Glaucoma, the number doesn't work. It is the pathology which is automatically taking care of the numbers. If you run behind the numbers, definitely sometimes you land up that your patient is progressing or the uh, disease is not getting controlled. So you look for the pathology and for the looking for that pathology, a complete analysis is to be done. And with that, this is your best friend in the glaucoma clinic, gonioscope. A simple gonioscope can help you to get rid of an uncontrolled pressure. We'll see it in the further subsequent uh, slides, how it happens so. So when we talk about the angle closures, the early detection of this angle closure disease helps a lot in appropriate management because it might come as a challenging task to all of us, especially when we are talking like countries like ours. So let's see that where all this best friend is going to come along with you. That's some of the clinical cases, whether it's a pupillary block or a non-pupillary block, the differentiation because the management differs a lot, we'll cover it again. The oppositional closure, this is with the four mirror images, and then synechial closure. Not talking about the principle, again, it's a theoretical thing that uh, basically the rays, when they come out of the eye, they go under the phenomenon of total internal reflection, and by using the lenses, the prism, with the, the, it gives you a reflected or a refracted image. So these are the direct gonioscopes. And as all of you must be aware that now the glaucoma surgery is buzzing up with a new thing that's MIGS, that's minimally invasive glaucoma surgery. And to this uh, comes this Swan Jacob lens. <clears throat> This Swan Jacob surgical lens. This is basically used for the intraoperative gonioscopies. And you know that the glaucoma surgery is far beyond trabeculectomy now and beyond valves also. So this is a particular picture. The bottom picture is This is the picture we are giving. This is the typical picture of interoperative gonioscope. That is the gonioscope kept on that eye, and you can see the angle structures. This uh, I'm so sorry. Ye point hai nahi kam. Kar rahe hain. Acha dekhe the. Okay, understood. Okay. So these these are the angle structures. This is the gonioscope, the Swan Jacob, and the basically the advantage of this is that it gives you a direct panoramic view of the angle, and the children also can be examined. Also, you can start your MIGS with the GSL. That's my take for you all who uh, is interested in doing interoperative gonioscopy. First, master the technique and start with the GSLs. So then going to the indirect gonioscope, you, there are various type of lenses. All of us are aware of that. Just taking a couple of names like single mirror, three mirror, four mirror. So you know the advantage at your stage, basically when you start doing the gonioscope, especially for the, uh, okay. especially for the first years, when you start taking the, uh, doing the gonioscopies, you need the stability. Because the view is blurred because of the gel. The hands are shaken. You are shaken. So for that, you need something which is stable, which goes and fits into the eye with the suction effect. So that is for that, you start picking up, up the single mirror or a two mirror or a three mirror. And then gradually, you can proceed towards the four mirror. Then uh, talk. this is a small video which I've tried to share with you all. Just 
I would like to draw your attention towards the special focusing points, especially filling the gonio gel, taking out the, any bubbles if they are there on the table itself and see how I have aligned the patient with the marker on the slit lamp. See that how we are pushing the head towards the headrest. See where is the light beam and when it is not uh, crossing the pupillary area. See, with that paper uh, tissue, no? I am remo removing the bubble there itself instead of struggling in the eye. Now see how the patient has been aligned. See the head, headrest is pushed. See the light beam. Now once you have done everything, you switch off the room light. Ask the patient to look up. Put the gonio lens. And now you focus the light into the eye. Now you examine the structures, write whatever you've seen and the most important part, removing because I have used the word suction. So what you do, you ask the patient to squeeze the eye and then you pull it out gradually. That's why I have showed it in the both eyes. Because don't pull it. Because there have been re uh, report, uh, report of optic nerve evulsion also with this, pulling out. So these are the four mirror lenses. And this is how a view looks like in the four mirror. So you can start with the Zeiss or the Posner one. Then gradually you can go with the Sussman, which uh, doesn't have a handle to itself. So we were talking about the appositional and the synical closure. So now going in the detail of that, you see here the top picture with a four mirror. Now this four mirror is useful when you talk about differentiating between the appositional and the synical closure. Let's see how and how it looks like. See in, the, in this picture, the angle is totally closed. And here, when you just uh, kind of indent it, it opens up. Then again here, synecule, this is before the indentation and e even after indentation, you can see the gross synecules are there. So this is how you differentiate that whether your patient needs an immediate PI or he, you can wait and watch for some time. Or you can need to intervene, intervene in some other way to just stop or halt the disease progression as well. So the minute you start any using any instruments, the first thing comes the washing off or the cleaning of that instrument. And when it comes to gonioscopes, definitely we all know, immediately go and wash it with soap and water. That will suffice in your OPDs. And for disinfection, later in the day, you can go for a 2% glutaryl dehyde or 70% isopropyl alcohol. The contraindication is really important. Any overt glow rupture, wherever you are suspecting any blunt trauma or any kind of thing, please don't go for that. Bes uh, besides it, any hyphema, if the patient is presenting to you with trauma, don't go for gonioscopy. So the indication is all the patients walking in your glaucoma clinic should undergo gonioscopy always. And it is not sufficing only once uh, done, it you have to just keep on doing at regular intervals for your patients. So this is how the gonioscopy, these are the things which you are going to assess for an angle. So just putting the thing together for the assessment again, this schematic representation, and this is the clinical picture you see here. This is the trabecular meshwork. Then from here, it goes the scleral spur, the processes, and the ciliary body. Two pictures are given for your use. Now again, a magnified view of that particular picture. You start with the Schwalbe's line, then comes the non-pigmented anterior TM, then pigmented posterior TM, scleral spur, and ciliary body band. This is how, once you master this technique, these angle structures, doing MIGS is never going to be a problem for you. So now, we have, I have spoken enough, now it's time for you all to speak. Can somebody identify the structures for me and can somebody tell me that whether it's open angle or a closed angle? Just a second. I'm, I'm not able to hear. Anybody? Please go ahead. It's simple. Open angle or closed angle? Then what is this? So, this was a pseudo open angle. Look at the top picture. And that is why I was telling about the indentation as well. See the top picture and see the bottom picture. Can you see that arrow mark here? That was the actual scleral spur. Understood? What we saw here 
was the pigmented Cholbe's line. And when you indent and manipulate, you see there is a double white area. Please don't go with that white area. At your stage, it's really very common, but you are not supposed to. You have to identify the associated structures. So that was a pseudo open angle. So now again, coming back to this angle closure uh, disease, where uh, it's in your theory, you can say it is a disease with overlaps and this all, all the stages like the blocks or whatever because of the angle closure is occurring, it is seen by your gonioscope. So let me show you the whole thing. Again, the diagnosis, anybody can come up with this. You see the pupil, you see the gonioscopic uh, findings. I will give you a, a clue to this that the patient had high pressures and uh, I'm not too sure that whether you're able to see that here. Yeah. Something is there, yes. So, so what is that? I, I, anybody can just get up and tell me. Laser PI and this is a case of angle closure. So this is a case of a primary angle closure glaucoma. That's synechial. So the minute synechy comes, this next picture comes in our mind. This is a chronic angle closure. That is a synechial closure. See how beautifully the angles are closing. Can you see here? It's open. And then gradually when you proceed to this side, it is closing. So that means this patient has undergone intermittent attacks of angle closure, which the patient would himself not known about it. And when the patient presented to you, the pressures are up. And if you only you focus in this area, you will say, no, no, it's open angle. But actually, it is a chronic creeping angle closure. This terminology is not used nowadays, but it is gradually closing up. So that is why I'm telling you, gonioscopy now. See, if you start treating this case with an open angle, it is not going to hold the progression and the increase of the IOP. Then you're running behind the numbers, but actually the pathology is lying here. So this is why I uh, put this picture here. So always, whenever you're doing a gonioscopy, please go to each and every clock hour of your angle. Now, this is how these are the acute emergency in glaucoma clinics that are acute angle closure case who is going to present to you with these kind of features. I'm not going in the details. So now let's talk about a case where a case is going to present to you of an angle closure like with a headache or a history of glare, hello. A simple uh, question, like if you ask from a patient uh, when you suspect a chronic angle closure, that when you come out of the movie halls, do you feel headache? Because there is a headache that particular time. Or in the evenings, in the mornings, even the pattern of headache gives you a clue that, okay, your patient is going for a kind of intermittent attacks also. Now, when you approach a case of angle closure, besides uh, uh, like uh, uh, color seeing around the bulb or those things, the common question which I would like to take forward at your stage itself is the history of drug intake. Because the savior of high pressures, that's the acetazolamide, itself can lead to high pressure sometime. So please, please be careful. And a very common drug taken for migraine, that's a topiramate. Definitely all of you must be knowing it induces the angle closure. So make sure that you go ahead and take a detailed history from your patient. So this was the case we were talking about that on examination the AC was shallow and you see the IOPs are shooting up to 29 to 34 millimeters and the gonioscopy shows that 360 degree is opening with compression and a patchy pigmentation. Again, the patchy pigmentation. The TM has to be absolutely clean, uniform all around. The minute you see patchy TM, there should be something in your mind. Okay, that means some kind of intermittent attacks are happening in the eye. So always go for the cleanliness of the TM. So this is how the eye looks like. And here you can see that the glaucoma flecans shows what? Glaucoma flecans are showing what? Past attacks. So whenever you see this, please focus on your gonioscopies. Then, now, uh, management normal. Everybody knows sitting here that uh, uh, diagnosis banai PACD key and we went off with the PI after lowering down the pressures and all. But again, a gonioscopy was performed. Can anybody tell me why again a gonio? Though the PI was patent, the pressures came down and we were quite happy. The disease was under control. But again, we did a gonioscopy. Why? Pigment and besides that, any other thing we are suspecting? 
C, again the answer comes here only. C, yes, sine wave. See, see here how the this light is depressing. Can you see the pattern of the light going? Going down, coming up, going down, coming up. So this is a schematic representation of what happens actually in these kind of eyes. Either after a patent PI, it is not opening at all, again the angle, or if it is opening, it is opening with difficulty. Or even after a patent PI, you are not able to control the pressures. So that's a new beginning again. It's not primary angle closure all alone. There is some other companion sitting with it. What it could be? Yes, excellent, perfect. So the clues, already you have given the answer, so no need for the clues. So this is the clinical picture. Can you see that double hump pattern here, here? Yes, so that's a plateau iris. So as the literature says, and now this plateau iris is confirmed with a UBM. And this plateau iris can be taken care of with a single pilocarpin itself. You put the pilocarpin, you put a single uh, AGM, the pressures are well under control. You don't need to just keep on doing the surgery or keep on adding the medicines for those particular patients. So always, always, again, my bottom line would be, rethink about your PI, anagonioscopy after PI is mandatory. Because always, as the literature says, that the angle closure part does consist of some part of plateau iris. So always rule out a plateau iris in your cases when you do a PI for your angle closures. So this is simple a classification which all of you must be aware of. Uh, this is just to show you that how important it is to document the sign AK. So now again coming back to this particular uh, photograph again, what do you think it could be? Do you think that PI is the solution to this particular case? though it's an angle closure. No, because it's not a pupillary block. Again, giving a clue to you, it's a post-surgical eye where because of the effusion, the angle have been closed. And after the treatment, this is the only place where the atropine and the steroids eye drop are going to help in an angle closure. Okay, I'll come to that later. So, <laughs> so good, I'm just really happy to see your enthusiasm. So, uh, so this is an angle uh, open after the treatment with atropine and steroids. And this is what you were talking about, your lost companion. That's malignant glaucoma. That's a, a history of surgery is done in the past. The pressures are shooting up. So now, what are the two DDs comes in your mind looking at this picture? One you have already answered and the other one is the pupillary block. So how will you differentiate between a pupillary block and a malignant glaucoma? Any, any one of you? Two minutes, Shreta. Done, sir. No more introductions. <laughs> yes, so pupillary block, there is a uniform shallowing and in malignant glaucoma, uh, sorry, the pupillary block, the center is going to be deep and uh, malignant, it's going to be like uniformly shallow. Uh, this is the slide showing the differentiation between the lacy pattern of the iris, iris processes, and this is a sine key. You should be able to differentiate between both of them. Now this is a traumatic eye. Showing the schematic representation and looking at the clinical photographs. See, you see the iridodialysis and see how it looks like a gonioscopic image. Magnifying that for you and showing you the processes as well. So these are the processes and this is the angle resection in these eyes. But what if a patient is coming to you with a history of trauma and the pressures are quite low? What do you expect? No RD. RD is not there. Yes. So this is an image showing the CD cleft. Hyperpigmented TM, you have to go in the terms of PDS. This kind of eye, what do you expect in your gonioscopy? Excellent. That's a wonderful lot sitting here. So that's a Schleem canal. And now th that is why I'm saying looking at the eye, you know that what are the things going to happen in the eye in your gonioscopy. So now these this everybody should know. The color, picture, depiction of your whatever the angle, angle structures you are seeing and any abnormality in the angles. Just talking and concluding my presentation with a couple of two, three slides, where you know that NVG is one of the most intractable glaucomas. But does it, it uh, really has always the nature of being intractable? The answer is definitely not, if you intervene in time. Because these are the stages of NVG, and as you can see, 
that you, if you intervene at this rubiotic stage or a secondary open angle stage, you don't need to go for valves or don't need to go for cyclophotocalculation. This is the pattern it is being followed. See how gradually here only sine key, then here NVAs which are zippering and finally the angle is closed down with ectropy on UV. So always my take would be that high magnification is to be done. So as I said, when the angle is open in neovascular glaucoma, even a medical treatment or a simple trabeculectomy can help you a lot. So concluding with some of the questions which you need to prepare for your exams would be like principles and type of gonioscopes, various methods of grading of anterior chamber angle, and gonioscopy, the role of it in having the diagnosis and management of types of glaucoma. So I would like to conclude my presentation with the saying here, that's I hear and if I forget, I see and I remember, I do and I understand, no matter how long it takes for you, but please keep doing gonioscopies because it does not matter how slowly you go as long as you do not stop. So with that, I conclude and your questions are most welcome. Anytime you can ask, even after the session is over. Yeah, only after the session. Thank yes. you very much. <laughs> You're already short of time. Thank you so much, Shweta. Thank you, sir. For uh, finishing and taking the most relevant parts. I think that was really good because our country is almost one third of the patients are angle closure and that is what she really covered beautifully. So with that, I would like to call upon the magician of glaucoma, Dr. Harsh Kumar, sir. Everybody knows him. And please see the magic of uh, glaucoma being spread with sir's talk. Madam, you clap to clap, yaar. So, uh, she talked about gonioscopy. You guys are so sad, I said, I said, I said, uh, so one time I gave this gonioscope to my uh, fellow ko, I said, let's do it with gonioscope. So it took 15-20 minutes, it took 15-20 minutes, it took 15-20 minutes, the patient came back and said, sir, you have seen it in one minute, it took so much to see it. So don't worry about that. <laughs> uh, and I'm, it's great to, honor to have Santosh over here because I think one of the most Beautiful things Santosh and Mahipal have done for PG teaching is eye focus. We even, I sometimes go back and if I have to take a talk somewhere, I open up those talks uh, by anybody and uh, look up and copy that. <laughs> so Santosh, wonderful job, Rashmin too, and uh, the entire team has done wonderfully well. Uh, so it is a pleasure to be here with you guys, makes you feel young. And we'll just talk a little bit about uh, oh, yaar, ye to talk ki galat ghut gaya. <laughs> Just a sec. So, why are we uh, interested so much in uh, optic disc? Anybody, why optic disc is important in in diagnosis of glaucoma? Kyo bhai? What is the aim? Examine the disc with confidence, mark out a glaucomatous disc, pass your exam, that is what somebody told me. When I said, what is the reason why I came to pass the exam, sir. But I told her that the most important thing is your exam in life when you are sitting alone and there is nobody to help you, that is the time. Please, one gonioscope should have you. You should have bought it. Okay, one is 90D and one is indirect ophthalmoscope. If these three things you master, you will always be good. Please do that, okay? So what are the questions that may, at least what is an optic nerve? How do we examine it? Is cup important or is it the neuroretinal rim? What is the size? What is this hemorrhage? What are the zones of atrophy? What is the differential diagnosis? Neurological anomalies, ACG versus OAG. These are all small, small things. Why is it important? Why, why is it a very important marker? By 30 to 50 percent of the patients of glaucoma which walk into your clinic will have normal IOPs at that point of time. Theke bhi? And you say, we will do perimetry. Kar lenge. Perimetry is an expensive test. 90 percent in the periphery may not have access to that. And even when you do it for the first time, so many of the patients will do it wrongly. So the trick is to be able to diagnose with the disc. Please, please just understand that part. And even progressions can be picked up, almost 40% of the progression in the early stages can be picked up by disc itself. 
so that is the heart of glaucoma evaluation because the structural changes come first so you take this patient corneal thickness 620 microns pressures were 20 to 24 in a diurnal variation field normal lag rahi hai disc kaisi lag rahi hai bhai kaisi lag rahi hai yaar disc normal hai bilkul theek hai perfect sab kuch normal oct normal field normal to maine kaha chhod dete hain ise because you know we were taught that uh, thicker the corneas we can leave it and then nothing is going to happen one year down that i called the patient in 6 month ek aur cheez yaad rakhna agar 6 mahine mein bulaoge to patient ek saal mein aayega to agar 6 mahine mein bulana hai to 3 mahine mein bulao so you uh, we called the patient in 6 months walks in after one year he is a one eyed patient and i was completely shocked so what can you see over here yaar iski upar lights dim ho sakti hain kya rolika can we dim the lights up there So what do you see over here is, what do you see over here? Very good, beautiful. So there is an RNFL defect over there. The notch is just beginning, but the field is still normal. So that is what I wanted to instill in you, that structural change is first. And that is why you really have to examine. So the OCT is showing changes, but OCT is how much it is. OCT is an expensive test. The first thing you will do is, uh, disc examination. So what is this optic disc that we are talking about? 1.2 million ganglions are all over in our retina. Unke jo axons are hai, all these axons will bend and come into the this central area which is the optic nerve and going through a fenestrated bundle, thousand fibers, are, uh, thousand bundles are getting into it. Once they go into the retrolaminar area, you'll get a myelin sheath over here the rest are all curving and coming the inferior and the superior poles and this is the vascular supply basically this is the lamina cribrosa pre-laminar post-laminar re uh, retro-laminar region and uh, the primary supply is essentially from posterior ciliary arteries you can read this up I don't think anybody is going to ask but you should have a basic idea of uh, where it is coming from posterior ciliary artery and its branches are the main supply Always, always dilate and examine. Always. Even I make mistakes. Ki un, uh, under the time nahi hai, chal yaar, aisi dekh lete hai. And then you miss out. You miss out the retinal findings 100%. O BRVO hoga, it, the field defect will be like an uh, arcuate scotoma. And you don't, uh, plus minus disc hai, oh, 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 this is glaucoma. It is BRVO because you have not dilated and examined. Dilate, examine and see in the red free light. Okay, the green light. That gives you the best things. Direct ophthalmoscope, yes, you can carry it anywhere in the world and see a patient over there, but too magnified an image. There is no stereopsis, so it's not really that good. You can see with the uh, slit lamp and your gonioscope that we had already talked about. The problem with the gonioscope is, achha, wo, what I was trying to say is that once you buy these things, every time if you are in a PG, abhi tumhare paas time hai. Baad mein private patients, it's very, very difficult to do these things. So put in every patient, every patient you put in a gonioscope and once you do a thousand gonioscopies, you'll say, oh, 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 this is not routine. So that is how you pick it up. It's not that you have to really learn these books and all. You'll immediately and us time you can go into your senior and ask, bhai, kya hai ye? but once you are alone, this is not possible. So ultimately, you'll have to buy a... 90D or a 78D or a 60D, 90D is the most popular, easiest to carry, stereopsis is good. So what are you looking at? You are looking at the margin of the disc, you are looking at the neuroretinal rim. So we keep talking about the cup, yaar, but cup important nahi hai. What is important is neuroretinal rim. You can have a cup of 0.9 and a normal person, okay? So be very, very careful. It is the neuroretinal rim. And what is important in this, almost 80 to 90% of the patients will have a isn't rule. Even today when I teach you and I'll go back and see some patients, I suddenly remember, oh, isn't rule dekhna tha. And suddenly I pick up some patients. So the inferior has to be, uh, inferior is the thickest, followed by superior bundle, followed by nasal, followed by superior, by temporal. So isn't rule ko mak karlo, please. And when this is being followed, it's good. If something is wrong over there, you know things are not falling into place. There's something to be more looked into. And once you look into it, you'll realize, yes, there are some defects over there. And uh, But the first trick is that you picked it up because the isn't rule was not being followed. 
So why the inferior pole or in the superior poles are more affected? <coughs> yes, we know that more fibers are passing over there, but the problem is that they have, over there, there are larger pores and thinner connective tissue support. So we know what is happening over there is that whenever there's a pressure gradient, the lamina cribrosa gets bent and there's a, uh, uh, pressure defect over there. Yes, we know that in NTG the effect is because of vascular changes and vascular is another phenomena by which the optic nerve gets damaged but the primary thing that we follow is the pressure gradient and that is why we always tend to control the pressures. That's one thing we can control. Disc damage likelihood uh, scale given by uh, Spath et al. is very important for you to mug up uh, especially if some examiners are coming, especially if Dr. Kirti is coming from MC as an examiner, so ratke jana. <laughs> there are some people who love this scale. It is very difficult to follow, but it is the ideal scale because it's actually talking about the neuroretinal rim. And that is what we have to talk about. So please mug it up. If you follow it, it's very good. If you don't follow it, still you have to know what if somebody asks you, you should know that there are 10 stages four stages at risk, then glaucoma damage, then glaucoma disability, essentially it tells rim width divided by disc. Okay, that is the ratio that you are talking about. And once uh, there is glaucoma damage, that means it is almost touching and this becomes zero. But then you uh, copy the extent at which it is being affected. Okay, so this needs to be learned by you. Uh, whether you follow it or uh, it's good if you follow but the problem is that most of the people if you write it down many people will not know what you have written because they don't follow it but you mug it up for the exam and then the retinal nerve fiber layer so you are very nice to pick it up please remember RNFL examination is very very important dilate red free light and then look for it first given by Hoyt and Newman these are slit like wedges so normally you will see white striations, but uh, slit like uh, this thing, wedge defects starting from the disc margin, BRBO, NAION, uh, retinitis, choroiditis, etc. can also have that. So be very, very careful. We have already shown you. So there is a notch and there is an associated wedge defect over there, but they are so much more clearer in the red free light. So you can just mark it out and you know that yes. The problem is that sometimes in tessellated fundus, etc., we are not able to pick it up very easily. And sometimes there will be a diffuse loss. So there are no wedges, but there's a diffuse loss. And then in these situations, the vessels will become prominent. And you know the disc is not looking normal. So you're looking for a wedge, but the wedge is not there because there is such a massive loss. But the uh, vessels will become more prominent because the fibers surrounding them have already died. Okay, so that also part you have to remember. Parapapillary atrophy, yes, again for the exam part, the alpha and the beta zones should be known to you, not very relevant, but we have to mug it up again. The alpha zone is not important, hypo and hyperpigmented areas, irregularity in RP, but it is the beta zone which, is, which becomes more prominent in glaucoma. Total atrophy of the RP and choriocapillary, large choroidal vessels become visible. Uh, not very sensitive, but the larger the beta zone, uh, it is likely that that is the area where the defects are going to occur. So this is how they may also progress with uh, the glaucoma. Another very, very important thing is the optic disc hemorrhages. So these disc hemorrhages are, uh, so this may be asked to you, where are they commonly located, okay? Which is the type of glaucoma in which it commonly occurs? What is the differential diagnosis? What is the cause? Wow, how, what does it indicate? So it is commoner in NTG, but even uh, if it is there, you must look for glaucoma. So you are looking for glaucoma. If you already know it's a patient of glaucoma, then, then it means that the chances of progression are higher and their disease is active despite your medication, so you have to be more aggressive. Okay, so we have to be very careful that despite your therapy, it's likely that the progression is taking place. So 35% uh, of NTG, OAG, 10% and they may come and go. It's not that they're going to stay there forever. Commoner in diabetics. 
they are in the cross margin and the disc one will absorb first like i said they will come and go the basic hypothesis was there is a rapid deterioration of the rim tissue and the rim notching causes the microvasculature to uh, rupture and cause these micro hemorrhages but they can also be present in diabetes optic disc drusen aion vascular diseases systemic hypertension leukemia sle even pvd can give you these cases so be very careful examine dilate check the retina also because that is very very critical <coughs> the color of the disc is very important many a times you'll you'll realize that no 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 this is not the normal color so normally it should be pinkish but because of the sclerotic cataracts coated 90ds etc you can get wrong colors sometimes if you are taking only photographs and you are seeing a photograph they may be overexposed and then again you will miss out on the color again red free in these cases will give you a greater this thing so pallor is very very important and normally if pallor is greater in cup then it is a non glaucomatous neuropathy okay so <coughs> again pallor is equal to cup we are good it's a normal disc if the cup is larger pallor is less then we are talking about glaucoma but if it is the other way round then we are in trouble and there could be uh, <coughs> uh, other non uh, glaucomatous causes okay so cup uh, cup looks suspicious okay is it normal no eh yeah. so that's what the most general ophthalmologists think and uh, but if you look the striations are all normal okay isn't rule follow ho raha hai ho raha hai na theek hai na kahin koi wedge defect nahi hai there is no wedge defect isn't rule is being followed we are worried only because the cup is large okay and this uh, girl went extensive examination only to be declared normal so be careful again you see asymmetrical cups yes we were already taught that point to ki asymmetry hogi we have to be very very careful and that is right that we have to be uh, careful in that part so you have to measure the size the simplest thing that you have to do when you see these patient is measure the size of the disc the average size is between 1.4 to 2 mm so if you have a well channel of thermoscope uh, the 5 degree thing will fit into a normal disc if it is large and small you will know but easier than that is that you sitting on a slit lamp you have taken a 90d and you know the magnification is 1.3 and then you can when the focus the beam and change this uh, focus so that you get the you get the markings over here and you know exactly what is the size of the disc why is it so because this is the simplest thing you are doing on the slit lamp only nobody most of the people are not doing it because large cups can be bhai physiological they can be myopic aur tumne won 10000 examination kar dale uske usko 4000 5000 ka oct karwa diya uska field karwa diya everything you have got done theek hai na and then later you find oh we uh, i wish we would have looked at the size so th this is exactly what happened over here it is looking asymmetrical right yes so we should examine the cup is large we are not bothered that the isn't rule is being followed we are not bothered that the striations are all normal there is no wedge defect anywhere but we'll get all the examination done theek hai na bhai paise to kamane hai na nayi machine khareedi hai bhai humne theek hai na so uh, but you do the field you find that the field is normal you do the oct oct is also normal and what you find here is that if you see the area the area is much larger the disc area is larger in the left eye and then you realize that it was the larger disc which was giving the larger cup and that was all and that you could have learnt while you were sitting on the slit lamp and doing that 90d examination that is all you could have saved all the test to that person okay so there are two tricks over there again the same thing this 12 year girl underwent extensive examination two things you have to do check out the size of the disc number one check out all these things kya kya ek bar batana bhai kya dekhoge wedge defect number one uske baad 
इज इन ट्रूल ठीक है ना दीज आर द टू सिंपल थिंग्स एंड द थर्ड थिंग इंपॉर्टेंट यू डू इफ यू सी ए पर्सन अ चाइल्ड लाइक दिस एनी बडी सॉरी हाँ रिफ्रैक्शन गुड वेरी गुड सो यू चेक आउट फॉर माओपिया एनी थिंग एल्स एनी बडी सॉरी एक तो बता दो यार प्लीज वेरी गुड नॉट नॉट फैमिली हिस्ट्री ऑफ ग्लोकोमा और माओपिया मेक द पेरेंट्स सेट ओवर देयर मेक द पेरेंट्स सेट ऑन द स्लेट लैम्प एंड सी देयर डिस्क If their disc is similar and you really feel it is uh, this thing, so first investigate the parents instead of investigating that small child. And I'll bring in another thing. What uh, tension ka pura ho gaya? I just want to say that taking pressure is an art. Okay, more than science, it is an art. Please remember that every day I am getting children. Oh, sir, pressure forty year. Surgery karni hai iski. You relax the patient completely. Relax the patient. Talk to them. Gappe maro onse thodi si. Then you do the pressure. The pressure is 40. Okay. So they do like this, and the pressure on NCT becomes 50. You do. You are doing a uh, this thing. Uh, 80. Uh, aise aise aise. Wo pressure it will come to anything. So please relax the patient before you do that. Okay. so once you make the uh, father or the mother sit and you realize what was happening over there vascular changes again somebody may ask you you have bayoneting in which because of the deep cup suddenly it is coming out like that like a bayonet bearing of the circumlinear vessels basically means that uh, the the vessels which were lying on some tissue the tissue is dying over there and the vessels now you can see like this okay It's not a hundred percent sign, but that should alert you that क्या भाई कुछ progression हो रहा है क्या इसमें? Same with overpass cupping. Again the same thing, right? So be careful about these things. What is the distribution of the fibers? That is also very very important. That fibers which are coming from the distance are lying in the distant part of the optic nerve. Those which are coming from near are lying in the नियर पार्ट ऑफ द ऑप्टिक नर्व सो ये एक तुम्हें बाद में याद होना चाहिए ठीक है ए इज द ए इज दिस एरिया विच इज अंट्रल जेरम्स रोमबॉयड विच इज गिविंग राइज टू प्रोक्सिमल आर्कोइट्स कोटोमा सो यू फील्ड का कोरिलेशन इससे अल्टीमेटली तुम्हें बनाना पड़ेगा बी इज द पेरिफरल रोमबॉयड जेरम्स रोमबॉयड डिस्टल आर्कोइट्स कोटोमा ओके सी इज See over here and here is inferior and superior temporal rims, which actually equivalent to peripheral nasal constriction. And D over here is the temporal rim, means central island. And this is the nasal part, nasal rim, which gives the temporal island. So you must remember that to be able to correlate. Okay, and that is why if the central area is affected over here, the fibers are dying here. You will get this effect. these are all arcuate scotomas and if very in the right in the periphery you'll get a nasal defect in the periphery okay so you can correlate obviously if this area is going superior inferiorly then you'll get a superior defect this superior inferior temporal so you'll get a superior nasal large defect over here because pretty much everything is wiped out over there inferiorly and what was the damage we already discussed that the lamina cribrosa will bend stop the exoplasmic flow in fear superior fibers are more affected mechanical primarily for oag and vascular for ntg kitna time hua hai bhai sir hai abhi 3 4 minutes hai bas <laughs> <laughs> sir that is magic of your talk nahi 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 wo tumne apna hisab mila liya main main jo tum logon ne extra liya tha okay differential is optic disc coloboma morning glory <laughs> uh i'll myopic disc very very difficult in all these cases if you if you are not sure then what you do is check out the family history check out the pressures and kyunki ye sari cheeze field defect dengi but their field defects will be stable so don't compare with a map or anything just compare that patient pre post and so on like that pet mein all of these things will be similar so i'll cut all this this is optic nerve grusen will give rise to similar things okay this is a this is a pale disc differential kya hota hai pale disc ka wo mnemonic yaad hai are kunjiyan nahi hoti inke paas aajkal 
ठीक है इसका है नाइटिक्स नाइटिक्स याद रखना भैया ठीक है ऐसे तो नहीं याद रहेगा न्यूराइटिस स्कीमिया ग्रैंडुलेमेटस हेरिडेटरी ट्रोमेटिक टॉक्सिक इरेडिएशन कंप्रेशन ओके नाइटिक्स जो एग्जाम से पहले होता है ठीक है ना तो दिस इज एंड ऑल्सो रिमेंबर दैट एंगल क्लोजर विल गिव यू अ स्मॉलर कप एंड अ फ्लैटर एंड अ मोर पेलर कप सो बी श्योर इट्स नॉट लाइक ओ ए जी कौन सी डिस्क नॉर्मल है इसमें से चलो यार एक आदमी को बता दो फटाफट इसमें तो पाँच मिनट ही छोड़े हैं पाँच मिनट तो लूँगा हाँ भाई डॉक्टर सागरिका आई जस्ट कमिंग ओके हाँ भाई हाँ जी प्राजी दसो राइट इज नॉर्मल लेफ्ट में क्या हो रहा है हाँ किधर किधर हो रही है इसमें लेफ्ट साइड पे जो दिख रही है वेर इज द नॉच सुपीरियरली वेरी गुड सो सुपीरियर नॉच एंड वी हैव अ इन्फीरियर फील्ड इफेक्ट ओवर हेयर ओके वॉट अबाउट दिस हाँ भाई येस मैडम फ्रंट बताए यार ये दिखा चुका हूँ पहले ये तो यार तुम कम से कम क्या है वेरी गुड ठीक है नॉर्मल फील्ड इसका फील्ड इफेक्ट कहाँ आएगा वेरी गुड सब सीख गए भाई हो गया काम इसमें कुछ है एनी थिंग हैपनिंग हेयर ये भी दिखा चुका हूँ सो दिस इज द वन विच वॉज नॉर्मल एंड वेंट इन टू दिस रिमेंबर नाउ दिस द वेरी फर्स्ट केस यू आई शोड यू ठीक है सो दिस इज अ स्मॉल इन्फीरियर बेज डिफेक्ट शुड हैव अ सुपीरियर दिस थिंग बट एट करेंट वैल्यूज इट डेंट हैव सो ओनली चेंजेस वर इन ओ सी टी ओके एंड दिस अगेन वॉट इज हैपनिंग इन दिस केस एनी बडी सो देर इज अ डैमेज हियर ओके सो इट्स नॉट ओनली एट द एजेज सो दे समथिंग लाइक एन ओवर पास कपिंग दो एग्जैक्टली द वेसल्स आर नॉट ड्रॉपिंग और एनी थिंग बट यू कैन सी दैट दे इज एन एरिया ऑफ डेफिशेंसी दिस क्विकली आई वॉन्ट टू टेल यू दैट इफ यू डोंट हैव सोफिस्टेड थिंग्स दे आर दी स्मॉल अटैचमेंट्स अवेलेबल इन विच यू कैन पुट योर फोन एंड पुट द फोन ऑन योर स्लिट लैम्प एंड टेक ब्यूटिफुल फोटोग्राफ्स विच यू कैन शेयर विद द पेशेंट ऑल्सो सो वॉट इज द मैसेज चेक फॉर साइज फैमिली हिस्ट्री न्यूरो रेटिनल रेम नॉट द कप न्यूरो रेटिनल रेम इज इन ट्रूल याद रखना है लुक फॉर नर्व फाइबर डिफेक्ट्स इन अ ग्रीन फिल्टर और अ रेड फ्री फिल्टर कोरलेट विथ फील्ड डिफेक्ट्स लुक फॉर ए सिमिट्री देर इज नो सिंगल फाइंडिंग इन ग्लोकोमा इज ऑल डन ओके सारी चीज़ें तुम्हें देखनी है प्रेशर्स का क्या हाल है फील्ड का क्या हाल है डिस्क का क्या हाल है ओ सी टी का क्या हाल है पेशेंट की फैमिली हिस्ट्री है कि नहीं वॉट इज़ द डायनल वेरिएशन सो नो सिंगल फाइंडिंग कैन गिव यू अ कम्प्लीट थिंग एंड प्लीज डॉक्यूमेंट सीरियली ओके दैट इज़ वेरी वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट एंड फॉर गॉड सेक पीपल कैन डू इट सिंपली आई स्टिल कैरी दिस दिस इज फ्रॉम प्रोफेसर गर्ग एंड एल एच एम सी एंड ही हैज जस्ट ड्रॉन दीज एंड बाई जस्ट बाई ड्रॉइंग दीज सिंपल थिंग्स ही न्यू दैट येस देर इज अ प्रोग्रेशन because the disc is crying okay you can see this but pl please save me please okay thank you very much thank you sir for a uh, elaborative and i'm sure uh, enlightening presentation for everybody sitting here so since we have got a time of 5 minutes to that you can come up with any of your doubts for the topics so far covered whether it is gonioscopy optic disc evaluation or pressure management ask only what we know okay theek hai na ek gol gol answer de pata samajh jana ki aata nahi isko acha which gonioscope will you buy come on okay so if you don't ask we'll ask ha sir ke sawal ka jawab kaun sa gonioscope matlab bolo 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 jaldi zor se isme to kuch nahi hai na yaar two mirror wrong answer okay uh, सॉरी ये उधर वाले ठीक है ओके फॉर रीजन 
सॉरी एक आदमी बोलो प्लीज जोर से कम ऑन इसमें तो कुछ नहीं है बोल बेटे खड़ा हो जाओ हाँ बोल फटाफट जोर से नो नो वो तो सब में ही है फोर मिनट तो सिक्स भी आ रहा है पॉइंट सबसे इंपॉर्टेंट पॉइंट क्या है कौन बताए वेरी गुड इंडेंटेशन बेटा एंड सेकेंड थिंग इज यू डोंट हैव टू पुट द जली ओवर देयर ओके अदरवाइज यू पुट अ जली द पेशेंट तुम्हें क्या कर रहे हो यार दे रियली गेट एंग्री एट यू सो दिस यू कैन जस्ट अटैच यू कैन प्रेस यू कैन इंडेंट सो यू कैन डिफरेंट वॉट श्वेता शोड ठीक है ना शी शोड सो ब्यूटिफुली दैट द मोमेंट इतनी अच्छी फोटोग्राफ तो मुश्किल से मिलेगी तुम्हें देखने को ठीक है ना शी हैड शोन सो ब्यूटिफुली एंड सो दैट इज वाई इट इज इम्पॉर्टेंट टू मिररर इज इम्पॉर्ट तुम्हारे क्या यूज़ कर रहे हैं श्वेता नहीं तुम बिगनर फॉर बिगनर्स यू कैन यूज सिंगल मिरर टू मिरर येस बिकॉज इट इज ईजियर ओके सो श्योर गो अहेड और तुम लोग रेच हो आजकल तुम्हें हमें तो पाँच सौ रुपये मिलते थे यार तुम लोगों को तो बहुत सारे मिलते हैं तो यू कैन बाई टू गो न्यू स्कोप्स ठीक है एस सर से इज नो फॉर फर्स्ट ईयर यू कैन स्टार्ट विथ सिंगल मिरर टू मिरर थ्री मिरर once your hand is stabilized please immediately switch over to four mirror because that will only come for your rescue sir ne bataya and next aur kya tha pressure pressure okay so how many people still are using uh, shiot stonometer and don't be scared about it because i know that whole lot of country is running on shiots if you are lucky and you are in an institution obviously you will get applications otherwise you may not get सो प्लीज डू लर्न शॉर्ट्स तुम्हारे इंस्टीट्यूशन में होगा तो उसको लर्न करो बिकॉज मेनी टाइम्स वेन यू गो आउट हेयर एंड देयर देन यू हैव टू दिस थिंग येस यू कैन हैव टोनो पेन्स एंड ऑल दैट बट सो ओके वी आर लकी नाउ टू हैव बोथ द स्टॉल वर्ड विद अस सागरिका एंड सो बनीता विल फर्स्ट स्टार्ट ऑफ सो एंड जस्ट वन सर ब्यूटिफुली कवर्ड द डिस्क असेसमेंट so that means i am sure that everybody is clear by this time that not all the point 7 cuppings are glaucoma always never never go never be deceived by the looks that is what we are being taught always similarly it stands whole true for the glaucomatous disc as well always focus on the other points what sir has taught you about the health of the rim the color isnt rule always not all it could be one of the physiological cuppings also so please be careful before because once you establish and certify this case is glaucoma all his life is going to be a glaucoma patient so uh, with that we proceed on to the next speaker dynamic speaker and as sir said the stalwart in the field of glaucoma we are delighted to have dr vanita pathak ma'am with us today and she is going to enlighten a very confused topic at your level that's the visual field assessment so ma'am she is one of the first persons to uh, initiate the mix in india yes and uh, she excited me also to do it so <laughs> i'm really grateful to her she's motivating and everybody yes <laughs> she is really good at her uh, basic talks are very very good so we'll uh, it's, you have you are lucky to have to her to learn this very good morning and thank you very much for the kind words i don't know if i can live up to it or not but i'll try my best um um so we're going to do visual field examination and um as you all know i hope you know that visual field examination is still non negotiable in glaucoma whether you do oct or not is immaterial you have to do a visual field you need to know functionally how much a patient is disabled visually all right so <clears throat> just to be on the same page every single word on this slide is important that glaucoma is a heterogeneous group of disorders it is chronic it is progressive and it's an optic neuropathy it gives you characteristic morphological changes not just in the optic nerve head but also the nfl and i hope you have learned to see uh, how to visualize the nfl because it is due to progressive retinal ganglion cell death and you have to have corresponding and correlating visual field changes iop is only a risk factor so why visual field 
uh, because that is the one function that is affected in glaucoma in uh, starting from the early stages. And what is visual field? It is that portion of space that you simultaneously visualize through a steadily fixating eye. And it's perimetry which determines its boundaries. I don't think I'll go through the, all these things. You, I think you all know that it is considered to be an island of vision in a sea of darkness. The hill of that vision corresponds to your fovea. So when you look at a visual field, you cannot uh, call fixation fovea. You have to call it fixation because it's corresponding to a structure. It's a functional function related to the structure. So why you need to do it? Of course, to diagnose glaucoma, and not just glaucoma, neurological diseases, uh, retinal diseases, and you monitor the progress of glaucoma, as well as some neurological diseases with <coughs> visual fields. Now, I think I've shared this with you guys. This is an excellent book. Although this edition is a little old, this is an excellent book that gives you a very good idea about perimetry and how to read a printout um, this particular article by Ravi Thomas, Dr. Ravi Thomas, is excellent. So what does perimetry do? There were two types, kinetic, which was used in the past, which looks at visual fields in an XY axis, whereas static perimetry looks at from a Z axis. So what is the difference between the two? Basically, kinetic tells you or gives you presence or absence of visual field or defects. Whereas static perimetry quantifies it, and that is why it is important in glaucoma. Okay, it looks at it from <coughs> quantification point of view. So the size that we use is standard in standard automated perimetry. It's four millimeters squared, and you can see. Look at the size yourself compared to a average size disc. And the thresholding is done, which is defined as. A stimulus in intensity, which is seen 50% of the time. You have to remember that visual field sensitivity is measured and expressed in decibels. It's a logarithmic unit, and 1 by 10 log unit is 1 decibel, whereas the maximum stimulus brightness corresponds to 0 decibel. So higher decibel values implies better retinal sensitivity, and on the other hand, low decibel values imply a brighter stimulus, right? <clears throat> so um, intensity is varied when, when it's measured. It's done, it, done as a bracketing strategy. You can go from a non-seeing area, uh, proceed in four decibel uh, values, and when it is seen, you go back up in uh, go back to retrace your steps in two decibel values and vice versa when you're doing it via a seeing area. This is how thresholding is done. So the questions you need to ask whenever you see a visual field printout is that has the test, first of all, has the test been administered well? And I've put it in brackets because it has to be in the background. You have to know whether the test has been done well. Is the visual field reliable? Is there a field defect? And is it due to glaucoma or not? Because there are other defects that can simulate, masquerade glaucoma. All right, so the standard printout looks something like this, and it's divided into zones in this paper by Dr. Ravi Thomas, as I was talking to you. Zone one gives you all the patient demogra demographics, you know, the patient details, the program strategy, the <clears throat> vision correction, the pupil size, as well as date, time, and age. All these are important. Why is age important? Because the machine um, <clears throat> has the ability or will actually match it with normative data. Okay, did the patient perform well comes from zone two. And these include fixation loss, false positive, negatives, as well as test duration. Please don't forget, the longer the patient takes, the greater the chance that the patient is, not, is fatigued. All right, so fixation loss rate <clears throat> tells you, it's a rough measure, of the number of times the patient fails to concentrate on a fixed Target. The implication is if you have high fixation loss, then it is underestimating glaucomatous damage. And of course, if it is high, you have to reassess. Um, 
false positive is a trigger happy patient. What does that mean? The machine sometimes give you auditory stimulus rather than visual. And if the patient presses the trigger, it docks in as a false positive effect. It means that there is an improper understanding of the test. Have a look at this printout here. You can see <coughs> on the, uh, although we, we should not be looking at the, at the, um, um, at zone three to start with, but you can see it's a white out. There are no points there, no sensitivity there because it is much higher than the foveal threshold. When you repeat it, you can see it seems to come back as normal. And this is related to high false positives. You get a white scotoma. Not only do you get a white scotoma, the other thing to look out for, if you look at the bottom there, total deviation is less than pattern deviation. Is that possible? That's not possible. Total deviation obviously implies overall field of vision, whereas pattern deviation uncovers your pot, uh, you know, your pothole in your vision. So <clears throat> what can you do? You can also have that in tests which are much faster, not just in tests that take time. Um, but remember, these features are very important, whether you, you get a white out visual field or pattern deviation more than total deviation means your test is not reliable and your patient is trigger happy. Then false negatives is patient inattention. And unfortunately, that does happen when the glaucoma is advanced. Then the gaze tracker. The gaze tracker I, uh, feature I love. Why? Because fixation losses only assesses at a few points. But gaze tracker follows the patient's gaze throughout the test. So that's exemplary fixation, where the patient is concentrating on the um, lights throughout the test. This is more or less acceptable, mostly consistent. Here, it isn't, because you have poor fixation. There's downward deflections due to blink, lids, whatever. All right, and here it has been switched off, unfortunately. <clears throat> so the gray tone chart, like I was telling you, is basically where there is extrapolation of data. The data is collected only at six degrees, uh, but extrapolation is taking place at one degree. So although this is easier to use this particular zone to explain to a patient, it isn't really where you should be concentrating. Total and pattern deviation, I just told you, total is uh, a, you know deviation with respect to age match normals and pattern deviation exhibits focal defects, your potholes in vision. So PD can never be more than TD, please remember that, all right? What happens is there is your, your generalized depression is corrected and your pattern deviation is uncovered, all right? You take the seventh best or the 85th percentile is selected and threshold is adjusted. All right, <clears throat> so have a look at the left-hand side. Uniform depressed total de deviation with normal looking pattern deviation tells you this is mostly due to cataract or refractive errors, okay? Pattern deviation worse than total deviation. Again, I keep repeating this. It's a reversed cataract appearance. This is a trigger happy patient. You cannot rely on these visual fields, okay? False positive errors are more. Then you have the global indices. You have your mean deviation, which is which is a uh, an expression in uh, in uh, mm, numbers. Uh, what you're seeing in total deviation, whereas pattern deviation is an expression of the focal defect in numbers. Okay, mean deviation is expressed as a minus. So it could be supra or infra also. Um, but pattern deviation is generally a positive number, okay? Staging of glaucoma, please remember worldwide is done on mean deviation. Mild up to minus six decibels, moderate up above minus six, up to 12, and severe greater than minus 12. And visual field index is, you know, was not available with Humphrey one, but Humphrey field analyzer one, but it's available with two onwards and is an enhancement of the mean deviation. It's designed to be less affected by cataract and more sensitive to changes in the center of the field, okay? Ex and is expressed as a percentage. And then the glaucoma hemifield test, which <clears throat> divides each hemisphere, superior or inferior, mirror images into five zones and compares 
it to the opposite zone. And you get three uh, <clears throat> on the printout, uh, four, four messages on the printout. It's outside normal limits when the difference is depressed P less than 0 0.01. When it's depressed P less than 0 0.03, it is called borderline. And it's called generalized when P is equal to 0 0.05. And of course, it reports it as normal when none of this has been reached. So the commonly used Humphrey Visual Field Analyzer programs are 30-2, 24-2, 10-2, and Macular program. And you can use, <coughs> and you do use standard size uh, stimuli, but you can use larger. And you do either a full threshold, which not many people are doing anymore because obviously it takes time, or you do a CETA. CETA is basically a Swedish interactive testing algorithm, which is relatively new, it's faster, but just as accurate and does smart questions. So it doesn't take time for every point, retinal point to determine the sensitivity. Why in glaucoma we don't want to do 30-2 is because you're testing 76 points. They're all six degrees apart. In 24-2, you're testing 54 points, 22 points less then 30-2. Again, because you, you want to reduce, not only reduce fatigue, but you get the same information that you want from a 30-2. You use a 10-2 for advanced field defects where more points are available in the central 10 degrees in a 10-2 plot. Here you're testing 68 points, okay? And the resolution is two degrees. <coughs> now, um, in Humphrey Field Analyzer 3, you have another algorithm. This is called H 24-2C. Uh, this is CETA faster, not just fast, but faster. When you do a CETA, you can take up to 8 to 10 minutes. 10-2 also takes 8 to 10 minutes. So if you need both in both eyes, you can imagine a patient is sitting in front of a field analyzer for almost an hour. 24-2 takes three to four minutes. 24-2 faster takes two to three minutes. And when you apply 24-2C, it adds only 30 seconds and give you, gives you additional 10 points in the central visual field, like that. Those blue points are all extra points, all right? <clears throat> so it's 10 extra points total 64 points, the additional points described to chosen from common areas affected in glaucoma, and the arrangement is not symmetric, all right? And so this is a 24-2 of a patient. You can see there is some change in the nasal area, which seems to fit Anderson's criteria. We'll come to that in a minute, and that's where the interaction starts. Um, but when you repeat that test with 24-2C, you can see that there is an extra change near fixation superiorly, all right? So it gives you extra information in probably less time, in early glaucoma, okay? So 24-2C is available in HFA3. Like I said, 10 extra points, only takes 30 seconds, shorter testing time, so less fatigue, and better than 24-2 standard for central points, and comparable to 10-2 for these central points. So, <clears throat> Let's start, how to read a visual field printout. Zone one, you need to gather your age, gender, eye, what strategy was used, and refractive error. All these points are important. Then you look at the reliability indices. Your PD should be less than your TD. Does the PD satisfy Anderson's criteria? Vanita, uh, sorry, but the slides are getting cut. Can you tell this guy to correct it? Rolika, can you help? Yeah. And shorter testing times cause lesser, lesser fatigue, pattern of loss, your MD, PSD, as well as VFI, and please, please, please don't forget to correlate clinically. Just because you have a defect doesn't mean that just because you have a scotoma doesn't mean it's because it is glaucoma. All right? So <clears throat> who would like to give me Anderson's criteria? I want to volunteer, quick. Nobody wants to look me in the eyes now. Yes, please, go ahead.
No, 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 no. All three less than five. One less than one, yes. Cluster has to be in? In the arcuate area. All these things you need to remember, please, like the back of your hand, this is very, very important. And PSD has to be depressed, less than five, and GHD should be abnormal. Thank you very much. All right, so who would like to interpret this visual field for me now, now that you know what Anderson's criteria is? <coughs> Lady in yellow? Yes? You want to take the mic, please? Please don't hesitate. We're all learning here. We've all been in that position before. Anyone? You want to? Come on. If you take time, then the interaction bit, you know, we, we just stop in two fields. You got to be quick about it. Tell me. Hello, hello, hello. I just told you how to read a visual field printout. Start with the age, start with the gender, start with your reliability indices. <laughs> yes, yes. Help her. Good. See, that itself gives, impresses the examiner, believe me. <laughs> Using CETA standard, uh, strategy okay uh, the reliability indices are uh, false negative 20 percent is little on the higher side Will you, okay uh, the visual equity is uh, corrected the pupil diameter is not mentioned and uh, looking at the uh, the third field uh, the this field defect it is showing in the higher uh, superior uh, superior area but looking at the total deviation uh, and pattern deviation. Uh, it has also seen like uh, due to cataract uh, because journalized deviation is. Don't more. give a diagnosis yet. Um, <laughs> the then uh, uh, Anderson criteria. There are non-edge points which are less than uh, zero point five percent. Okay, so your MD is minus 15. That is very significant. S significant. You, Anderson's criteria, no, no question about it. It is, it is it being is coming in the followed. Severe, uh, yeah, field looks defect. like severe superior field defect. The bottom one, you can sort of more or less say maybe it's edge artifact. That was 2018. This is 2019. Has the patient's glaucoma improved? The pattern has changed as well. Now superior doesn't look so bad. The inferior looks worse, maybe in the arcuate area. He has under one cataract surgery or no? No. Good. Patient has learned how to do the fields better. Here we are. This is 2020. This is learning effect. So Learn. Don't, yeah, don't jump at the diagonal. Just, just because you've got a printout which looks like glaucoma, but your disc does not look like glaucoma, please repeat. Please repeat, all right? So this is the change that has happened over a period of time. Patient has learned to do the visual fields better. What is the difference in the third field? Can you pick out? Uh, no. Very good. So if it is 24-2C, patient is taking much less time, less fatigue. Patient has done much better. All right, okay. But can fatigue not happen? <laughs> can you not get learning effect in 24-2C? No, that's not true. Even in that you can get, and you have to repeat to see, because here very significant central points, you know, seem to be uh, affected. Whereas on the right-hand side, you can see that that seems to have vanished. Okay, please sit down, you don't need to stand. Right, now this is an overview. I don't know whether you've seen it or not. Um, again, um, just for the sake of time, let me show you patients' visual fields seem to be improving. Okay, and these are at different times. Look at the disc. You just had a disc lecture. Do you think this disc is glaucomatous? But this disc was diagnosed as glaucomatous. 
all right? Only because we have not learned to decipher normal from abnormal, pathology from physiology. Okay, although fixation losses had been much, but until the patient gets a normal field on a disc like that, you continue, <laughs> all right? So the takeaway from this section is that there is a learning effect. Please remember that. There is a fatigue effect. Please remember that also. Visual field does not improve in glaucoma, okay? Patient's performance does. Therefore, it is recommended that you have at least three baseline visual fields in the first year and up to six in the first two years if you want to talk about progression and always, always correlate clinically. Does this satisfy Anderson's criteria? Quick. This is how you need to see, okay? I know you have to look at patient demographics and everything else, but as a quick overall view, does this satisfy Anderson's criteria? It doesn't, so it's an edge artifact, all right? What about this one? Does it satisfy Anderson's criteria? <clears throat> Where do you see the, red, the points being affected? Blind spot, yes, near the optic disc, near the blind spot. Where do you expect early changes in glaucoma? Nasal. Nasal, okay? When it's temporal, it's unlikely glaucoma. Unless you have contiguous points joining in the arcuate area, coming up to the nasal, nasal area. So here's another one. What, what about these two, two, two areas superiorly? Ever heard of clover leaf defect? We'll come to that in a minute. Basically, patient does, is not even aware that the test has started, all right? And that defect inferiorly, you know, mostly temporal, not going nasal. Of course, you're not seeing a corresponding fellow eye, but nonetheless, this is, there are more false positives. As you can see, it has been marked out there. Even fixation losses are quite a bit. So when it was repeated, it was completely normal. Don't be foxed by first visual fields. That's the take home message. Now, <clears throat> which visual, sorry. Um, how do you interpret this one? Does it look glaucometers? Does it satisfy all the criterion? Yes, it does. Fixation is threatened. Can you see that? Yeah, there are points close to fixation at least in three quadrants. So what is your next step? Excellent, yes, you need to do a 10-2 to see whether fixation is involved or not. The difference between the points between the two fields, six degrees versus two degrees, yes. What happens when your um, you have really advanced visual fields and patient can't do a 24 dash two, is doing a 10 dash two, and you're still not getting a good enough response, but the patient's vision is good. You have to do a macular program. Macular program has 16 points only, but looks into the central five degrees, all right? And through the macular program, you can make out whether or not there is split fixation. We'll give you the definition in a minute, sorry. Can you see that the patient has 20-20 vision with this kind of visual field? How is that possible? Fixation involved in all four quadrants on a 10-2, okay? So you do a macular plot. What do you see in the macular plot? You can see in the top left-hand quadrant, all points are depressed to zero. Okay, that is the definition of split fixation. Two, three minutes only, sir. <laughs> okay, right. So has the test been carried out well? You know, there are some technician-related issues, refractive error. If you see a concentric defect like this, it's not always retinitis pigmentosa. Please be aware that the trial lens set lenses should not be used. Only the special lenses provided should be used. There's another one here, plus 13 probably the patient is aphakic, so you use a contact lens, 
all right? So there are ways and means of doing it. Has the test been carried out well? In the first four points that were tested in each quadrant, patient was attentive. After that, the patient slept off. So you have the clover leaf pattern. And this is the reversed clover leaf pattern, whereby you, the patient did not know that the test had started. All right, so this is the technician's problem, clover leaf. Okay, then uh, technician related issues, gaze tracker is off. All right, but you know, that, that happens all the time. Um, I will actually skip a few slides now and go directly to um, neurological fields since I don't have time. Um, I wanted to say the typical cataract will look like that on top, okay? TD, definitely much more than PD or no PD at all. When you have typical glaucoma, your PD will be less than TD. Please remember that. And when you have cataract and glaucoma, you, you, you have both, okay? Uh, what about this one? It satisfied uh, Anderson's criteria, but unfortunately it was because of laser. Yes, laser to the retina. So this is not glaucoma. However, you look at another one, satisfies Anderson's criteria, correlate clinically, you can see nerve fiber layer defect. I hope you can pick up now. Nerve fiber layer defect, inferior one especially. So this is glaucoma. How about this one? Again, satisfies Anderson's criteria, although I have not given you the full printout, but it's because of a coloboma. All right? So you don't just pick up a field and print out and say this is glaucoma. All right? So the key takeaway from this section is that clinical correlation is mandatory. So the last, or maybe one more, myopes are, are you know, a hell of a lot of difficulty in diagnosis, all right? So this particular disc showed this kind of visual field defect. Don't look at the gray tone chart, please. Go to the pattern deviation. Where are you seeing the defect? Quick, quick. Around the blind spot. Yeah, blind spot is increased. So you can correlate it clinically so well, yeah? So it actually does not have Perimetric glaucoma, unfortunately, patient did have glaucoma, secondary glaucoma, secondary to PK and secondary to ICL. Uh, he ha underwent a trap and he did well. All right, there's yet another one, myopic, that was not picked up. Now, if you look at the um, uh, red free, you will be able to pick up the shallow cup. Remember, myopes typically have shallow cup, both eyes. This is how when it was picked up for him, his glaucoma, but he deteriorated quite rapidly and became like this when he came to me. So uh, he underwent clear lens extraction and complained of visual deterioration. Never mind. So we move on to the last one here, this lady. You can see <coughs> large discs. What do you think about the color? It looks pale, doesn't it? But the patient was diagnosed as glaucoma, visual fields were done and this is how they looked. Now, the point that I want to make is that you must keep your visual fields left on left side, right on right side, as opposed to how you examine a patient. Remember that. Then it becomes very clear what the problem is. Very good. Okay, so the patient did not have glaucoma, patient had a pituitary, pituitary tumor. All right, so glaucomatous visual field defects, respect the horizontal midline, whereas with neurological respect the vertical midline. I think you know that by now. I don't think I'll go to any further cases. We will just summarize now that <clears throat> it is the, definitely the responsibility of the technician with respect to proper carriage of the test. Reliability parameters determine how well a test has been done by the patient. Be aware of the learning curve, it's very common, all right? Always need to answer, is the abnormality due to disease or artifact? Learning curve is also an artifact, all right? And pattern of abnormality determines whether it is due to glaucoma or retinal or neuro-ophthalmological lesions. Clinical correlation mandatory, all right? Thank you very much.
Thank you, Vanita. I think that was really wonderfully done, and I think I guys have learned a lot from this lecture. It was so good. So we now have Dr. Uh, Sagrika, uh, and we are running a little short of time. So Dr. Sagrika, Major General Sagrika Patel, had uh, joined us in Center for Sight, New Delhi. She is a senior glaucoma consultant and who's done wonderfully well. Uh, even in army, she was one of the backbones of the glaucoma treatment in the country, and now she does so well surgically and uh, technically she is giving such good lectures. She is on the verge of printing her wonderful book. So uh, she will be enlightening us on the Imaging in Glaucoma Interactive. First of all, good morning, and thanks, uh, Dr. Harsh and Dr. Okay. Uh, thank you all for being here. I'm going straight to my talk because the topic that has been given to me too is imaging in glaucoma. It's a huge, vast topic. I don't know whether I'm going to do full justice to it. I can't, but let's carry on. So the first thing is, what are we going to image? See, we can image the optic disc, the retinal nerve fiber layer, and the angle. What can we image the optic disc with? The HRT. And the OCT, also simple, stereoscopic photography. Let's not also forget, we can also draw. Retinal nerve fiber layer, you can do it by the optical coherence tomography, HRT3, and also the GDX VCC. Unfortunately, GDX VCC is no longer being used to that extent. Angle region, yes, you can do it by the ultrasound biomicroscopy as well as by the ACE OCT. Why do we need to image? I mean, everything has been discussed. Dr. Harsh and Dr. Vanita have talked about Clinical examination is an absolute must. So why do we image? See, it cannot, all these imaging devices cannot diagnose glaucoma or progression. But it is used to create a foundation for diagnosis. Remember, there are many patients who are unable to do the fields. For them also, this, how do you monitor? So you can, of course, do clinically, plus we can also do it by means of imaging devices. Because we, by imaging, we get an objective, quantitative, accurate, Precise, most important, reproducible measurements of the optic nerve head features, retinal nerve fiber layer, and macular substructure. The software which is available that can also show us progression. What is the change that is taking place over time? Then we have all also got the software which is able to tell us whether this is statistically significant. Is the change which has taken place in the patient's eyes, is that significant? Is it normal or is it not right. Let, let's look at red-free photography. It's very good for focal defects. Can you all see this uh, defect out here? It's between the two um, uh, arrows. Yes, this, this must be picked up, even clinically. Limitations, you need to have a dilated pupil. Sometimes you get diffuse loss. That's very difficult to pick up. If there are mild changes, it's difficult to pick up. So we, I'm going to talk about the optical coherence topography, which, as you know, everyone is using to a large, large extent. And this is based on light. There's no contact with the tissue which we are imaging. The wavelength which is being used is 810 nm. Low coherence, near infrared beam projected by a superluminescent diode. What is it measuring? That means we're throwing in light. That light is getting then reflected back. That, now, there is a delay in the reflection of light. That's called eco time delay. And then you are also looking at the backscattered life. Because of this backscattered life that, uh, uh, light that is coming, the, uh, the software is able to de determine a reconstruct, let's say, a depth profile of the tissues which we are seeing. And therefore, we can make out various depths of tissue we can make out, we can reconstruct the entire structure and therefore construct a three-dimensional image. <coughs> now, there has been a huge amount of te changing technology which we have seen through our years. First of all came the time domain technology by Zeiss. Now, in this different time eco delays produced by the backscattered light, they are measured separately. Very important, very slow acquisition time. When you are slow, therefore you have got limited data. You can't gather that much. Now look at these. TD OCT collects only 400 axial measurements per second. What is the resolution? 10 microns. Can anyone tell me? Is 10 microns better or 5 microns better when resolution is concerned? Anyone? Quick. 
Very good. Why? Because we want to see the minutest structure. Now, spectral, then came spectral domain. Spectral domain, what is it? The interferometer is there. Uh, we are determining the output by means of a spectrometer. That is why spectral OCT. How much is it measuring? 20,000. So from 400, it became 20,000 so, uh, measurements per second. Axial resolution, five. We can see the minute structure. And then came what the next new kid on the block was swept source OCT. Mind you, swept source OCT might come as a short note. Please prepare it. Comes as, as what, what about the spectral domain? You can image ocular structure with better resolution very fast. We want something very fast, right? Because if you have a shorter acquisition time, then when the eye moves, mind you, it's very difficult to keep a steady eye. When the eye moves, then the motion artifacts are not translated into that. Then you can collect a huge amount of data along with that so you can reconstruct a three-dimensional imaging. Now, suppose you want to do the, uh, the imaging again and again. Now, this is able to register that scan thing. That means this scan will be a point number, let's say this 2000, 1998, let's say 2000, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It, so scanning will be the same. So that's extremely good. Higher resolution, more precise registration of retinal layers. Now comes the swept source OCT. So this was introduced in 1212. It uses light waves. Now what is it using? It's got a very narrow bandwidth, which it is uh, passing across various frequencies and catching all the light, right? Now this has uh, a fixed arm, just like the spectral domain. This also has a fixed reference arm. It's got no spectrometer, unlike the spectral domain. But it has got a complementary metal oxide semiconductor camera. Believe you me, I don't understand this. But however, you've got to write it in your exams, so that's what. Along with two parallel photodiode detectors resulting in a very high speed. So we had time domain, how much? 400. Then we came spectral domain, how much? And now we come down to Vietnam in lakhs. What is it? 100,000 A scans per second. Resolution, 10, 5, 5. And improved signal to noise ratio. Remember, we want a very good signal to noise ratio. So, I'm sorry. Now, which laser is used in the SDOCT? I've just mentioned it. Yes, yes, laser is the superluminescent diode. Now, these are printouts which I've shown you from the three very commonly used. There are many others, of course, which are used, but commonly used OCTs, right? So first one, which is there, is called the opera from the RTVU. Second one is the commonly used Cirrus. And the third one is Spectralis. Now, first important thing, how do you obtain a good scan, right? What do you do? You choose the right protocol. Choose a long protocol. Now, most of you will go to sleep. Similarly, the patient also, he will also go to sleep. We can't collect data. So all of you wake up now. And so in order to get correct information, you must have a, a very good right scan protocol, which is a fast one. Adjust the scan position. Now, suppose, for example, I take a particular point of light and shine it on somebody's face out here. Now, I want that to be shone right in the center. Right, so we have to choose the protocol which the centration of the scan should be right on the optic disc, should not be above or below. That's very important. Check the signal strength. The strength, is it good or bad? And different machines have different strengths that I've talked about it. Is the, if the patient's eye dry, because mind you, you'll not get a good image, ask him to blink, put artificial tears. Very important, check in the printout are the black areas. Black areas means data is missing. So therefore, this will ex get extrapolated. Please have a look at the signal profile. Now we all know the isn't rule. Similarly, all rules also come in the OCT, the Tisnit double hump. That is the superior hump, the inferior hump, showing us about the superior retinal nerve fiber layer and the inferior retinal nerve fiber layer. What about the retinal thickness quadrants and sectors? Remember, it is not just the quadrants. You have to look at the sectors. Please correlate with what Dr. Vinita has talked about, visual fields. Don't forget what Dr. Harsh had talked about. Look at the optic disc. So, I mean, you have to keep on doing correlation. Involve the patient. Ask him to look properly, to blink, etc., etc. Please don't forget the cost to the patient is extremely important. And therefore, one scan a year is more than sufficient. Do not rely on colors. We just look at the green and say, oh, fine, don't do that. You have to, um, just affirming normalcy is a mistake. You must do a clinical examination repeatedly. We are going to talk about that. And if you have in the OCT a combined information of both the ganglion cell IPL, that is the in, uh, inner plexiform layer, as well as the circumpapillary retinal nerve fiber layer, 
this definitely is, gives you better information than just one one parameters. Remember, all the tissues which are affected by glaucoma can be evaluated by OCT. Now, the next thing that will come up and we all have to learn about it will be the lamina cribrosa. Now, let's have a look at the simple printout. Can anyone try this printout? Or should I go, go ahead and read it? Yes, anyone would like to try this printout? So first of all, this is the printout of an RTVU. That is the, op the OptoView printout. Now, if you look at the first thing is demographic data. As pointed out earlier, you must see whether the, it's the patient's name. Most important is age. Why is age important? Anyone, why is age important? Because, yes, they are going to be, uh, it's going to be the normative data. We want to know where does it fall. If you've got a 10-year-old or let's say, a 15-year-old or a 20-year-old, and then you're comparing it with the 80-year-old, that won't do. So that's why that's very important. Next, check the signal strength. Now, in this machine, as per the manufacturers, it should be above 40. Now, in, unfortunately, in printouts, you'll find that the signal strengths are given in various places. In this, right, look at the center. I have put it in red, right? And where it is, uh, SSI is 55. That's just below the GCC. Whereas, if you look at the optic nerve head, it is 31. Now, why is there a difference? Can anyone tell me? Anyone can tell me? Because when you are doing the macula, at that time, the patient is looking straight ahead. So able to catch all the signal strength will be very good. When you are asking the patient to look at um, taking the optic nerve head, you are asking him to look a little on the other side. So what's happening? Iris comes in between. So as a result, your signal strength automatically decreases. Now let's have a look at the, I'm sorry, there's no, uh, there's a cursor out here. How does it work? See, uh, oh, I don't know what I've done. Okay, right. Actually, I wanted to point out, look, look, sir, please, isko kaise dobara karta hai, just bata dije ka. The, look at the first uh, picture. Now, on that, is, that is basically the ganglion cell complex. Then comes the optic nerve head. Now, in the center of the optic nerve head, you will find that there is a, haan ji? Touch kaam karega, okay, thanks. Now, look at this, this one. Now, this is the, of the optic nerve head. This center is the, is what? Blind spot, isn't it? And then the retinal nerve fiber layers come. Please have a look at this picture out here and look at this picture at the bottom. That is the left eye. You'll find that there, is, there should be a lot of red and the hot colors over there. That's signifying that there's a lot of nerve fiber tissue present superiorly and inferiorly. That's the picture that gives the image information. Then after that, have a look at every sector. Don't look at the colors. You look at the figures which are given over there. That's very important. And then now look at the next picture, that is your fovea, the GCC. That is showing the statistical significance of each, which I will again keep on describing. Once you have done that, now go to the next one. The, the, this is the summary parameters. Most of us don't look at the summary parameters. It's very important to look at it. It's giving you three bits of information. The first is the retinal nerve fiber layer analysis. So if you're getting an average retinal nerve fiber layer analysis, superior, inferior, very important, inter-eye. Why inter-eye, anyone? Why inter-eye? Because remember, the hallmark, one of the hallmarks of glaucoma is if there's asymmetry, right? Asymmetrical dresses, I know, are now in fashion, but not in glaucoma. In glaucoma, if there's asymmetry, then it is, please have a look at it carefully, probably glaucomatous. Now have a look at the optic nerve head. Very important. In optic nerve head, we must have a look at the cup disc area. Now you have seen the patient, you found it's a small disc. Have a look and correlate, is the disc area really small? Remember, there's a wide range in Indian population of the optic nerve head size, varying from 1.5 to approximately 3, depending on various populations that have been done. Along with that, please have a look at the vertical, the rim area. And what is the rim height? Rim we don't pay attention to. Please have a look at this. The information is lying just in front of you. As well as look at so disc area, the vertical cup disc ratio, the rim area, and the rim volume. And then comes the GCC analysis, where it tells you about the average GCC, superior and inferior GCCs, and inter-eye GCCs. Everywhere it's talking about what is the symmetry between the right and left eyes. And two other features, which are the FLV and the GLV, which I'll talk about. Next, look at the, two, the graph below. In the graph below, you can see that there is a normative data has been as per statistical analysis. That means people having a normal RNFL have been ranged and given the color green. So if this, that means that this population is approximately 5 to 95 percent, 
And in this case, the left eye is falling within that range. It's got two humps, superior, inferior. Sometimes you'll find the second hump, that is because the image has been taken also from a blood vessel. Then you find the inferior, the inferior line, it has gone into red. That means telling us definitely there is a defect out here. And the asymmetry has been shown in the last graph, which shows us there's immense asymmetry. Now, again, going further on this particular thing, I would like you to have a look at, now this is all the figures are given per sector-wise, and over here in the left eye, we find sector-wise the figures, the numbers are much, much lesser. And what we have to remember is that, it, the, that there are two protocols, that is the GLV, this measures the average amount of uh, ganglion cell loss over the entire ganglion cell map, right? And the FLV, which is most important to us, what Dr. Vinita talked about in perimetry, that in glaucoma, there are focal losses. So we're hunting for these focal losses. So FLV, it measures the average amount of focal loss over the entire GCC map. In an opto view, please pay attention to this, that the GCC is equal to what all? It is taking the retinal nerve fiber layer, plus the ganglion cell layer, plus the plexiform layer. Now, what is the, I have talked about the Tisnit graph curve. Right? What is the NSTIN curve? Anyone? Anyone? Okay, I'll answer for you. So this was by Dor Donald Hood et al. Please read about it because this again may come as a short note. It's one of the latest things that has come out in OCT. With the NS NSTIN plot, the temporal quadrant of the retinal nerve fiber layer is displayed in the center of the B-scan. This portion of the disc is extremely crucial for everyday visual function. So he's put it right in the center. So instead of beginning from the nasal, nasal area, we are beginning from, uh, rather, instead of beginning from the temporal area, we're beginning from the nasal area so that the temporal area comes right in the center, which is extremely crucial. Please read about it. This is extremely important. Now comes the GCC analysis. Now have a look at this. This is the GCC analysis, this is the thickness map, where you find that right around it's all blue and light green. And then again, you, how much is this map deviated from the normal? This is again showing in the form that yes, there's a lot of deviation. Now we do this statistical analysis. Yes, the software tells us that this entire, which was shown in the form of black, this has become red, showing that there is a huge amount of ganglion cell loss present out here as well as out here. And so we look at the deviation map. I've already talked about it. Just remember, what is black is definitely 50% loss or greater. What is blue, there's thinning, 20 to 30% relative to normal. And this, I've already talked about the GCC significance map. Remember, this is a statistical analysis where all your patient's data has been compared to what is in the normal data. Now, how will you check the quality of scan in a city? Anyone? Anyone? Remember, I told you, they are all different in the different OCTs. So I'll answer for you. Now remember, in the opto view, you found the signal strength where? In the center, yes? But over here, we find it right in the top. So over here, look at it, signal strength, this is hardly five and seven. This is acceptable? No, not at all. Moment you have a low signal strength, you're not going to pick up the retinal nerve fiber layer properly at all. That is why it's very important. Now let's look at the retinal th RNFL thickness. All of you know what is the meaning of RNFL? Retinal nerve fiber layer. Now, in this case, when you look at it, you find above and below are the two nerve fiber layers, very thick, very nice, surrounded by a sea of blue. On the other hand, when you look at the left eye, you find only top ones are there. What about the bottom? It's a sea of green. So we know that there's definite thinning out there. Then we look at, after this RNFL has been done, we see what is the deviation. Is it, how much is it deviated from normal? So in the right eye, we find there's hardly any deviation, whereas in the left eye, we find the reds and the yellows have come, which is telling us, yes, there's a mountain of deviation. It's also telling you where the deviation has taken place. Now you look at the center, the average thickness has been given. Remember, average thickness is extremely important. In Indian eyes, in the study done by Dr. Ramanjit et al., in uh, RP center, it was uh, found to be approximately 100 plus. So in Indian population, we know that's approximately 100. So anything below that, we know that's going to be abnormal. Now let's have a look at the sectors. So sectors are normal, whereas in the left eye, we find sectors are definitely abnormal. Now we look at, sorry, this is the quadrants. Now look at the sectors. We find that in sectors, there are two sectors which are definitely abnormal. Very important to note what is the signal, the number over there. Okay, now we look at the two maps, that is the profiles, and we find that the upper profile is quite good, that's the right eye, and the lower one is definitely lower, and that's the left eye. 
Now, this is the RNFL testnet graph, which I've already talked about. Don't forget the lower photo photograph, which I've given, the lower picture. What is it? It's the tomogram. It's telling you whether the segmentation of the layers of the retina have been done well, right? So I've talked about only this. This is only telling us about the RNFL, right? Now, in the cirrus, when we're talking about the ganglion cell layer, now this is known as ganglion cell analysis. What was it called in OptoView? Ganglion cell complex. This is analysis. Over there, we had the retinal nerve fiber layer. Over here, then they're not taking the retinal nerve fiber layer. On the other hand, it is only taking the ganglion cell layer and the inner plexiform layer. All right, now we come, I told you, we need to have lots of information from whatever structures can be affected by glaucoma. So we look at the optic nerve head. And cirrus as well as spectralis, including OptoView, but they have not to use the same, uh, same method. Over here, they have gone on to, who knows about the Brooks membrane opening distance, any of you? Yes, so OCT is able to delineate exactly where the Brooks membrane opening is present. In this, you can see these two red dots, these are the openings by determined by the OCT. And then you have the inner limiting membrane out here. Now this has been taken by line scans. Mind you, this is not of a serous OCT, this is of a spectralis OCT. And what do we find? Now this distance between the, this red dot and the internal limiting membrane, this distance is known as the minimum rim width. Now you all know, when you're having a look at the optic nerve head, the optic, the neuroretinal rim is different in different positions. We want to know where exactly it is thin or not, or where it is thick or not. So this minimum rim width is very, very important, and it's going to give us a good quantification by means of OCT, and uh, uh, this can be accurately determined by this OCT. Now let's have a look at this picture, which I've put forward for you. This is by spectralis. By the way, these are not my pictures. This I've taken from the net because I thought this was very, very explanatory. Now the spectralis, you can see that, okay, here the nerve fiber wedge defects are present, and then the cirrus OCT, the measurement ring, what I talked about, that the ring should be right in the center. This ring is 3.5 millimeters. And whatever is reduced thickness, see, this has come in the form of red and re yellow. Very, very important for you to understand this. So I'm repeating the same thing. And then you, can, you take the BMO, which has been measured, and also the internal limiting membrane. And after that, you can get in each sector what is the rim thickness. All of you awake? Yes or no? Good. Now we have talked about, remember, the cirrus OCT, which I have talked about earlier. We were talking about the RNFL, isn't it? But now we have got another thing. I've talked about the neuroretinal rim. Now here in this, the first is the thick RNFL thickness. Yes or no? Yes. After that, we've got the deviation map. And here we have talked about the neuroretinal rim thickness. And this has come in this particular plot. So you can look at the plot and you come to know where does the neuroretinal rim thickness lie besides the various parameters. And don't forget this tomograms, which we all don't look at, but we have to look at. Now comes the ganglion cell analysis. In this, the first picture, this again has been taken from the net. This is by um, uh, Ronnie George, right? And the GCIPL thickness map, this has an elliptical el and measured annulus, which is centered right on the fovea. Now look, it is not circular. You look at this. This is ellipsoidal, right? Then we come to the deviation map. It shows deviation as being compared to the normal. And then comes the ganglion cell thickness. It has been compared to the normative data. And this excludes the fovea, right? And then comes the average and minimum ganglion cell layer in the plexiform layer and thickness data, which has been given out here. And we've got the B scan image, which is present below. Now, which is, I want the answer to this. This is a very important question. Which is the most likely area of early ganglion loss in the macula? Anyone? Anyone? Very, very important question. Maybe asked. Oh, come on. It's the macular vulnerability area. This is just inferotemporal to the fovea. Write it down. A very important question. This is by Donald Ross and his associates. Right. Now, I have also asked another question I want, to, um, I want an answer from you. Is the GCC, the ganglion cell complex of the opt OptiView, similar to the cirrus and um, uh, spectralis? If you've heard me, then you'll immediately answer. Yes or no? No. Very good. So. In the OptoView, I've already talked about this. I'm not going to say it further. But remember, there are different layers. And in Heidelberg, that's a spectralis. That's also different. Caution. When you're looking at the macula, don't forget, there can be concomitant macular disease. There can be macular edema, epiretinal membranes, ARMD, et cetera. Now, I want an answer to this. Should the image be repeated? This imaging be repeated. Anyone? Yes. yes. Why should? Why? Yes. 
because there is the black spots which I've talked about, the data is going to be extrapolated. So along with that, we find also that perhaps, okay, this is all right, this is all right, but remember that you, and the signal strength is extremely low. So you must pay attention to these things. Can OCT be a useful in advanced glaucoma? Yes or no? No, why not? Because of floor effects. Yes, OCT is definitely less useful in the later and advanced stages of glaucoma when the disease runs to the floor effect, right? So RNFL is no longer detectable when it is approximately 40 to 45. There's only glial tissue, so we don't waste the patient's money. So we should not do that. Very important, very, very important is normative data which is present. When you're buying an instrument, don't forget you have to get the normative data. In the cirrus OCT, they have 284 healthy individuals. The age range is between 18 and 84 years. Why is age range important? Because if you get, let's say, a child, obviously you can't take, do, I mean, I'll look at the normative data because his, his uh, information is not there. He can't be, it can't be compared. Or let's say even, let's say you are taking a person who is, let's say, 20 years old, right? You have written the age incorrectly and it has gone up to, let's say, 40 years old. Then what is happening? Obviously, you're going to have changes. And ethically over here, ethnically, you have 43% Caucasians, 24% Asians, 18 Afro-Americans, Afro 2012 hip Hispanics and very poor Indians are only 1%. So and yeah, I'm going to go further. There's going to be age-related changes, parameters which are important, I've already talked about. Here, spectralis OCT, 15 decibels, very important. Hood report, please read, read about it. There can be OCT errors in patient-dependent, operator-dependent, machine-dependent. There is progression analysis, both in the form of event as well as trend-based analysis. Remember, this is extremely important. Of the two of them, trend is extremely good. So this is how it looks like. And you've got red and green disease. Don't forget the Heidelberg tomography, of which the, this is of the Heidelberg 1. This is of the 3. And this is totally different. Most of us don't have HRT, but you must know this particular picture. And this is the scanning laser polarimetry, no longer being used to that extent. Don't forget the anterior segment OCT. That is the anterior. And this might come as a short note. And anterior uses a 13 nm light source. And it's got a, I'm going to show you a picture of our, I mean, uh, uh, I don't know whether it's going to run or not. But this is the anterior which is available in our center. And we took the picture of something that we could not see at all. And it's got such fantastic high resolution that we could see every structure that was available out there. And thank you very much for a patient hearing. Any questions, I'm more than willing to field it. Thank you, Sagrega, and the time given wonderful work. I think they have really learned greatly from you. Thank you so much. Thank you. And uh, Dr. Mathur is waiting. So before he throws me out, I'll invite him here. <laughs> so thank you all. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Harsh. Thank you, Shweta. Uh, thank you, Sagarika. We, we move on to our next uh, glaucoma session. May I invite uh, Dr. Manoj Chandra Mathur and Dr. Purvi Bhagat to chair the session. Uh, guys, we don't have a, a break right now. Please uh, don't go all of you at together. <laughs> Too much of pressure. <laughs> Too much of pressure, yeah. So uh, it's a pleasure to uh, introduce Dr. Manoj Mathur first. Dr. Manoj Mathur comes from Hyderabad. He's a very well-known uh, glaucoma specialist. He practices at uh, Swarup Eye Center in uh, Hyderabad. But more importantly, a lot of times when we are in academics, when we are teaching, when we are practicing, we don't worry about what's happening around us. We don't worry about uh, the societies that we are part of. But Dr. Manoj is a little different that way. He has been a very active member of Hyderabad Ophthalmic Association, uh, Telangana Ophthalmic Association. He's also contributing a lot to the All India Ophthalmic Society. And we wish you all the best that you're going to contribute even more uh, in the coming few years. Dr. Purvi uh, comes from Ahmedabad, the city where I grew up. Uh, she is the professor and head of the department of uh, prestigious uh, BJ Medical College. Uh, before we start the session, one quick announcement. We have a very 